welcome to the 35th episode of the Nerdum and Other Nonsense Anime Podcast. Today we are going over the fall 2017 season's 5th and 6th week of shows. Just as a reminder, we also always include the timestamps in the description of the YouTube video and podcast feed if you wish to only hear about one or two specific shows. And since we are a review slash synopsis slash discussion podcast, everything's going to be a spoiler. So forewarning here. My name is Leo and I'm just wandering around the infinite forest because what else am I supposed to do? Oh, look, a chipmunk. Also with me is Beacom. Hey, Leo. How's it going? Pretty good. Playing a lot of Fortnite because it is super fun. Yeah, uh, for the past week, you've been, like, yelling at me to download it on my Xbox. <laughs> and I've just been like, uh, uh, I'm finishing all these other games, and I'm busy, and uh, maybe later. <laughs> it is, it's, it's pretty, it's really fun to solo. It's fun to go in duos. But if you can get a squad, which is four people, it is an absolute blast. Uh, just yeah. yesterday, I was playing with uh, our good buddy Kyle and both of Savage's younger brothers. And oh, that's cool. They had they, they were terrible. They had only played like <laughs> two games themselves, and so like we were showing them the ropes. But it was just it was such a blast. It's so much fun. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that game. It's a lot like PUBG, except it's like more cartoonish, and you can like build a lot of stuff. Yeah, you can like, do you can buildings, which gives a whole different like aspect to the gunfights and stuff. And they're yeah. awesome with the updates. Since I've only had the game for like two weeks. They had a six gigabyte update, and then today they just came out with a 10 gigabyte update. Oh, wow. Like, they are hammering into this game. You know, a certain studio <laughs> might take a hint. Uh, sorry. Yeah, maybe if the that. Infinite Forest was like a, a 100 on 100, like, uh, multiplayer mode, then yeah. we'd know Bungie's getting the message. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's really funny is I really only picked up Fortnite, so I just hold me over till PUBG comes out. But I'm having mm-hmm. so much fun with uh, Fortnite. I feel like I might play a little bit of PUBG and end up going back to Fortnite. I don't know yet. It's Let's very see. possible. I may end yeah. up playing both. But Yeah, we'll see. And it's free. So I can't I can't recommend everybody at least give it a try once. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely a well-made game. Uh, I would give it a try. Yep. All right. All right. So let's get into anime. Really? Why? <laughs> Sure, why not? (laughs) That's what we do here, right? Yeah, I think Uh, so. (laughs) Okay, so starting with Sundays, we got Anime Guitaris episode five called Baby Don't Go. Uh, So summertime has come, and uh, when you reach summertime in an anime that's about like meta anime, you know they're all going to Kamaket. So. Like, the anime club is really excited for that thing that's coming up <laughs> by the sea. And we all know that's Kamaket. But, of course, like, Manoa, being a newbie, is really out of the loop. So they just tell her, like, bring folding chairs with you because there's really long lines. And uh, here's a catalog of all the stuff that's going to be on sale. And we, like, bookmarked the pages of the important stuff. <laughs> and so she, like, tells her little sister, her sister that she's going to a festival by the sea. And her sister, like tells this to the parents downstairs and the dad like gets like an electric shock through his body when he hears uh mm-hmm. which we later find out is because like he's going to the summer comic head as well yeah like, his and you buddies. totally see him and i didn't recognize him either <laughs> oh, i was wondering where you saw him because like i i totally missed that i was looking out for him but i didn't see him he i, must I have saw been him didn't think anything about it but it's in the next episode they do like a quick flashback of him there and then i'm like oh yeah. i remember that scene <laughs> that was him oh oh nice nice <laughs> yeah he was uh directing the uh lines he was that guy so I had this weird moment when uh, Manoa was walking up to the train station, uh, like in this episode, because I was like, wait, is, I recognize that train station. Like it was well drawn enough that I recognized it as Ikebukuro Station uh, in Tokyo, Tokyo. And that was pretty cool when they pointed that out. And um, so, yeah, like just good accuracy by them, I guess. Um, they get stuck waiting in line outside Kamaket like forever like that's one of the things I like the most about this episode is that they're just in line for like half of the episode at least which is like I think realistic and of like big con experiences and oh, like yeah, especially I want to say Kamiket. everybody who was who was helped produce this anime episode has been there themselves because they just <laughs> nailed everything way dead on <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they like get lost trying to find their way back to the line when they go to the bathroom at one point like Arasu and Manoa head off uh, and like 
Arasu snaps her fingers for Sebastian, and but Sebastian gets like yelled at uh, by the comic at security for like sliding around <laughs> like like he does. Um, but luckily, this cute girl comes up to them who was behind them in line before, and she's like, she says something at first in like a weird language. So I was like, what? What is she talking about? And then Manoa gets fluster, flustered and responds, "Spit cakes!" Like she's trying to figure out what to say to her in like English, and all she can think of is spit cakes, which is weird. <laughs> Yep. Anyway, she brings the girl brings them back to their friends, and then Arisu actually admits, like, I've never been to a comic hit before, and apologizes for acting like she knew everything. That's why they got lost. Uh, and it turns out the cute new girl is her name is Yang Bebe, and she's from Beijing, uh, so she's Chinese, and she was able to recognize Manoa by her Ru Zero pin that she was wearing in line, like Ru Zero. Um, and if you recognized her voice, it's for good reason, because it was Kana Hanazawa who was voicing that character. Um, Manoa downs the, the last bit of her Pokari sweat, which, God, when I was in Japan, Pokari sweat, like, kept me alive. It's oh, so yeah. good. It's just, like, this delicious, like, sweet, like, almost water drink. It's a little bit like Gatorade, like, Frost or something like that. It was delicious. Hmm. Really refreshing. Um and like finally this like wave of applause starts like rippling through the crowd indicating that they can finally like start moving in but like they realize like even though people are starting to move in they still have like another hour to wait on this line and like they're getting like killed by the sun and stuff it's it's really hilarious <laughs> Uh, and they finally get inside and this is like almost the end of the episode now and like Arisu and Manoa like immediately get weighed down because they like pick up all of the free merch and they were like, their friends are like, we should have told you, like, don't take everything. Just like take the stuff you want. Um, and Erica goes to talk to a cosplay buddy who's sitting at like an anime club's table. And the guy asks her if like the Sakaneko anime club is still as legendary as he's heard. And uh, apparently someone told him in the past that it was like a very prestigious anime club at one point. Um but so that's that's interesting for the future. Uh, they forgot to get Bebe's contact info before she left. But Erica reassures like Manoa, like, since we're both anime lovers, I'm sure we'll all meet here again someday. And that's like the end of the episode. <laughs> so it's just like uh, it was one of the better comic hit episodes I've seen. Uh, and I've seen a lot of them in like the past few years with all of these like slice of life anime. Like they almost always do like a comic hit episode somewhere in the middle. And this one felt like really realistic. Like they I, had I like... Yeah, oh, sorry. I was going to say it just I feel like it really delivered the experience if you were actually there yourself. Yeah, like that part where they had like the security guys like calling out like anime stuff like I don't know. I forget what I can't remember examples of it was like don't get lost in line because like you'll get run over by like something or something <laughs> like I don't know. It was just like all anime references and I was like, oh, that's a cute thing. Like I'm sure they actually do that. So anyway. Uh, moving on to the next episode uh, called Kai Kai Love Climax. <laughs> so <laughs> this episode's um, focuses on uh, or starts with a scene of like Manoa's friend in track club. Uh, Yui heading to the locker room to take a shower after a tough practice with God rays of light hiding all of the lewdness. It's not very, it's not actually a very lewd scene. And like Yui is like the only one in the show that like is really fan servicey whenever they do shots of her, like in her mm -hmm. track poses and stuff. Uh, but they're making a point of it this episode uh, for a reason. Uh, it's like so brief, like I wouldn't mention it, but like this episode focuses on uh, anime tourism. And so the club are like on a train headed towards some anime meccas. Uh, anime meccas being like towns that have been in anime or like locations and stuff. Uh, and they have a conversation on the train about how bath scenes can change the perception of an anime. <laughs> so Mano is talking about God rays and she's like, they're one of the mysteries of anime that show up on TV and then vanish on the discs. So like basically you're saying like it's they, like it's they're trying to sell their own dvd <laughs> yeah they're already like hawking their own dvds which is hilarious i like that a lot <laughs> uh as a side note there are some indications that miko might have a crush on kai kai and he gets super flustered when she stumbles into him boobs first on the train and he yells this isn't my genre before running off <laughs> which <laughs> i was just laughing so hard it was really good this isn't my genre i like i want like a girl to like come on to me and i just want to be able to say this this isn't my genre and just run away <laughs> just be the I'd pay to thing. see that <laughs> <laughs> so 
the first anime mecca they stop at is a real one. It's called uh, Orai in Ibaraki Prefecture, which is home of the girls in tank tops, as they call it in this anime. But it's actually girls in Panzer, the tank anime, tank yeah. girls. Uh, and it is like re- really in Orai, all this stuff. Um, and meanwhile, in his head, Kai Kai is fighting like this supernatural battle against Miko, who is invading his heart. Like he's trying to like deal with that. He's having feelings for this girl and he's fighting like a supernatural anime battle. Um, they head to the place they book to stay and find it has like no TV or DVD player. And they're really upset at their like uh, club supervisor for not telling them that. And they're upset because they're going to miss the show Yuri on Nice, <laughs> which that was a pretty obvious reference. Yeah. Um, so Kai asks uh, Koki for advice on when to know if a girl's in love with you. And Koki uses uh, the show Ore Monogatari as a reference, explaining how the main character didn't think he's uh, the signs that Tomato, who is Yamato, uh, were giving him were real because he didn't think anyone could fall in love with him. Uh, and this is complicated further when he gets a line message from Miko with a random heart emoji at the end of it, which he doesn't understand. He's like, what does this heart emoji mean? Mm-hmm. Um Mano is a little depressed though because she she feels like she's been she's been screwing up all day. She's been like slipping into like cardboard like girls on Panzer things and like just like screwing up pictures. And so she's like really depressed that like she's an anime noob and like feels like she doesn't fit in. Um, and so she goes off to like find the baths by herself, but accidentally takes a fork in the path and get lost gets lost in this infinite forest, if you will. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> the other characters a go looking for before you said it. I was like, oh, no, he's not. Go- he did. <laughs> of course I did. <sighs> the other characters go looking to, like, reassure her that she just needs to be herself and enjoy anime as she's been doing. They love her for that. And so Arasu calls in Sebastian to help with the search. And he shows up with, like, well, first he fires, like, a huge, like, rail gun or something into the sky, which summons, like, three search helicopters that launch flares and search the forest from above with, like, basically Metal Gear Solid music playing in the background. It's pretty badass. Um, And then Koki eventually is the one to find Manoa, who is, for some reason, tied to a tree by some vines. Everyone meets up and then the climax comes with Kai, who's been driven mad by his quest to understand if Miko is in love with him. And he runs naked into the forest towards them. And luckily, his junk is covered up by real life god rays in the form of like Gomon's flashlight, the club, uh, uh, whatever, the club supervisor. He's got a flashlight, but he then turns it off and the girls are like, ah, and then Sebastian instantly covers with his like rail gun. He fires the rail gun (laughs) in front of his crotch to like get the God rays going again. So finally, the confusion is sort of cleared up kind of when Kai just confesses to Miko, but she misunderstands this as him confessing to Koki because they just came out of the baths together. And so then, and then she's like all into it because she's like a Fujoshi. She's like, oh, my God. Oh, man, I, I'm not usually into this. But like with you guys, I, I could see this happening. I don't know. So yeah. now he's just, you know, beside himself. And that's where the episode ends. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I really like the constant costume changes in this show. Yeah. yeah. It's so, so realistic, like, like, and, uh, but one of my, the f- things I think is funny is they, you know, they do the God Ray scene early on and then they talk about how they go away with the DVDs and they're flat out doing that. Well, then at the end we get Kai Kai who's being covered by, uh, these God Rays and I'm just sitting here wondering, I'm like, are those going to be gone too? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> oh, wow. Equal representation. <laughs> I guess, I guess, guess. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I, I wonder if either of them will be gone because this show has been so very not lewd up until this point. That will be interesting to see if they yeah, actually I will say do Miko get rid of those. got a lot of uh, boob action this episode. She did, and she yeah, I, I noticed that more than any other episode. All the so squishing, far. and then the very last scene when she's there and she's in a robe from the thing is just mm-hmm. full on cleavage. Also, so yeah, yeah, for a high schooler, she's yeah, <laughs> she's got some <laughs> big boobs. So yeah. anyway move on uh yeah let's move on to the next show though uh so junie tyson gone tuesdays we got episode five called a wolf in sheep's clothing uh and yeah the episode titles sort of give away some stuff but not everything in this episode at least yeah Um, i i saw one uh it's later on and it like flat out says one of them dies i was like what yeah that's pretty bad (laughs) It, it it was bad Unless they're just being really uh, crazy with their wording or something, but 
Yeah. yeah, the more I'm reading about this, the more I think that it's just following the traditional Zodiac storyline. Necess- like, and so I don't know. We'll see. But I have some theories about where the show is going. But um, so this episode five starts with a meeting led by Duo Decupul, the overseer of the Zodiac War. And he's like addressing his world leaders who are watching. And we learn that like, are so they this world is a- leaders. I think they're world leaders, but he called them VIPs, at least. I don't know. I think they're just really rich people. It could be because they're like betting on this war. Mm-hmm. Um, so this we learned that it's like a proxy war being fought by the 12 warriors for the fate of who will control the world until the next Juni Tyson. So like there's a lot riding on this little battle. Uh and they, they basically, from like what's happened so far, they come to the conclusion that there's like a really high probability that either ox, rabbit, or monkey will be the last three that are left alive. They're not sure what to think of sheep because he's the like really old guy who won a tournament in the past. He won the ninth Juni Tyson. And even though he's past his prime, he's not screwing around. Um, rat gets mentioned in passing and they, they don't really say much about horse, tiger or dragon. They don't really talk about either of them. Uh, but we learned that like once three more warriors die, uh, they will commence betting on like who is actually going to win. So sheep decides that he is too old. He's past his prime. So like he can't just confront the three front runners of this battle on his own. But if he can strategize and take them, get them to take each other out, he'll have a much better chance. Um, so after a brief update on like monkey and rabbits face off from the end of last episode, they're still fighting each other. Uh, rabbits just like testing her out and making really derpy like uh, noises. It's just <laughs> I don't know. Rabbit is weird. Uh, oh, we yeah. return to that's an understatement. <laughs> Yeah, Rabbit is batshit. We return to Sheep for a flashback of his story, uh, his backstory. So Sheep made his name as like a weapons merchant and as well as like a skilled warrior on the battlefield. And he's especially skilled at using explosives. Like it's his signature trick. And I think I remember in the first episode, him asking if he could use explosives or something like way back at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Um so, like, we see him, like, using them to take out pirates who, like, wouldn't pay him for the his weapons he was selling or, like, soldiers on the battlefield he takes out with explosions. And, like, once he gained enough notoriety from all that stuff in his past, he was adopted into a noble Sujie family. Um, and he fought in the Ninth Juni Tyson, which took place on, like, a space station. And like the way he, that was awesome, by the way, I want to see that show. Uh, but like it, it, that show wouldn't be very satisfying because like the way he won was that he just like separated himself from the rest of the ship in like a container or like a little shuttle or something and then just blew up the rest of the station with everybody inside it. And that's how he won that. That's just Judy like Tyson. H- highly in his favor. That Junie Tyson was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that one definitely worked out. Like explosives on a space station. Yeah. Yeah. You even see some of the other contestants like in the window staring at him. (laughs) Yeah, they're like, no. (laughs) Um, So he had because when you win these tournaments, you get like your one wish granted. Uh, Apparently his one wish was basically to like live a long, like simple life with his grandson to be able to see his grandson's face. And that's basically what he did. Winning one wish with the Battle Royale, can you say Twisted Metal? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, This might be, uh, if we got some young listeners, you might know know about Twisted Metal, but it's uh, it's a a video game where you battled in cars, and it was Mm -hmm. on the PlayStation, and it was actually really fun. But That That was was a really good game. And when whoever your guy was, when you uh, beat the story mission and uh, won, your guy got one wish granted. (laughs) That's cool. I didn't remember the wish part of that. That's awesome. Yep. Uh, so yeah, he, we see him like, he kind of like lives raising his grandson and, uh, there's one point where his grandson's like, I think you're getting old grandpa. I don't think you could take on like these warriors anymore. And he like takes that as kind of a challenge, but also like he, he chooses to take place in the current Junie Tyson because he does, he wants to go in his grandson's place. He doesn't want his grandson in it. So that's part of why he's here. Also probably to prove that he can still you know, kick ass. Meanwhile, so Rat has his hands full with like the zombie snake who is chasing after him with like a flamethrower. Uh, Monkey is doing everything she can to negotiate with Rabbit while he's attacking her, saying like, you can, we can work together and like, I'll try to grant your wish, whatever that is. Um, so it turns out that Sheep 
hid the poisonous jewel that they all swallowed at the beginning of the tournament. Instead of swallowing it, he just put it into his beard, like right underneath his mouth and hid it. So he doesn't have that jewel inside of him. So he's not worried about the poison. And he thinks like, how can I use this to deceive one of the other warriors in my favor? Uh, meanwhile, Horse, who we're really seeing for basically the first time, has been trying to team up with Ox. And Ox was like, no, the time to team up was like way before now. Like, I'm just going to kill you. Luckily, Horse has this like ironclad defense that's like his biggest strength and was able to like run away. Um, but after that, Ox is somehow able to track down like Sheep's location. Uh, luckily, the front entrance was booby trapped by a Claymore, so Sheep gets away. Uh, and so then he irons out his plan, which is to, te- he wants to team up with horse, uh, by claiming that he can remove jewels from like his stomach, like by using like quantum, quantum tunneling or some bullshit. He's just going to make up a lie, which is how he got the one out of his own stomach is what he's going to say. And, uh, like if that doesn't work, then he has like an epic grenade called old timer that he can use as a last resort. But like basically he was looking for somebody who's in the middle of the pack that he could team up with to like take down like maybe one of the bigger guys before turning on them, essentially. And at this point, they're all like three hours into the Junie Tyson in total. And meanwhile, Rabbit, still fighting Monkey, starts using like zombie birds to like help fend off like her attacks. And Rat figures out that Zombie Snake is able to track him only by the vibration of his footsteps. So that's how he's been following him, even though he doesn't have a head anymore. Um, And at the end of the episode, Sheep is like stumbling around. He comes across Tiger, uh, who is the warrior who he thinks is like the least capable of all of them. Because and like you see her, she's on a park bench just getting drunk off of her ass, like burping, like. But like somehow, like even though he's pretty far away from her, she's still able to hear him coming and like asks him to come over. And that's where that episode ends. So a lot of like setup in that episode for the next episode, which is pretty batshit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if, if you've noticed, uh, I'm glad to see that the battling started up again. Yeah. And also, uh, we've had a lack of deaths recently, but we're oh, going yeah. to take care of that <laughs> next episode. We really will. So episode six, even a champion racehorse may stumble. Yay. You get some general more screen time of the ongoing battles and ox trying to track down sheep. Uh, sheep also continues to talk with uh, a way wasted tiger and presumably under- underestimate her as the weakest of all the warriors. Uh, every time somebody underestimates somebody or they get too cocky, they die in the show. So uh, we know what's going to happen now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sheep makes a decision to uh, kill her right here and now. But then Tiger flies across the screen and rips his stomach open, just like, bam, immediately. Uh, she calls her style the drunken fist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rabbit and Monkey's battle is progressing nicely, and Monkey is slowly starting to figure out Rabbit's fighting techniques. Monkey knows if she can get behind him, she can put him in a hold and negotiate again. So she goes th- and gets behind him, and suddenly Rabbit reverses his blades and stabs her right in the chest. Right through the yeah. boobs, man. It's brutal. <laughs> and she's like, how did he know where I was? And then she kind of looks up and sees a snake's head sitting in a tree. Yeah. And then she so dies. So he had vision from snake's eyes, I guess. Yeah. And just before they got there, they were battling. He ran off and led her specifically to that location. So mm-hmm. he knew what he was doing. So with those two deaths, it brings the total of warriors left to six. And this causes those VIPs who are watching to start placing their bets. Um, Horse, meanwhile, has found a vault inside a building where he is hiding from Ox. Uh, he believes he will die because he could never, he, he'll never be able to beat Ox. So he's just, he can't figure it out. Then this is where we get his backstory where he was on a patrol with the squad in the jungle and he gets like taken out by an assassin. He survives barely and then undergoes lots of body altering medical procedures to make him stronger. Yeah, that was uh, a pretty all, badass montage. All these training. <laughs> all these different training things. It was pretty crazy. Uh, the end result was his, uh, his special technique was, is called the impenetrable defense technique stirrup. He also wonders if his body is changing to counteract the poison. And if it is, he still might live. But then he is suddenly startled though. When rat starts talking to him, who was in this vault with him somehow, apparently snuck in and Ox didn't know how they have an exchange of dialogue. It's m- a lot it's more of the same kind of conversation you had with monkey in like episode two or three or something like that 
Uh, but then Rat leaves him, but tells him, you know, you might be careful because there's snake, snakes after me and he might be on his way. Uh, so Rat disappears again into the darkness and then Ox suddenly realizes there is smoke and starts freaking out before he runs off auction and dies hiding away. Oh, that, uh, that's Horse, not Ox. Oops, that's sorry. Right. Horse. Don't worry about it, yeah. Why did I, why did I put that? I don't oh, know. Well, who cares? Horse, yeah, he dies in the vault because he ran out of oxygen because Snake set the entire freaking building on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. So, yeah. yeah, a lot of death that episode. Three deaths just out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, so, a couple of funny things, and I have some, like, serious things to say about this episode. Like, one of the funny things was, like, in the beginning when Tiger is facing up off against Sheep and she's so drunk, she just sees, like, extra clones of him everywhere, mm-hmm. like, all around. And she's like, what is this? Is this, like, a counting sheep thing? What the hell? <laughs> so I just thought that was really funny. You know, she also calls it a cloning technique. Yeah, cloning technique, like cloning yeah. sheep. <laughs> she does both. It's, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, and then when Rat is talking to Horse in the vault, he's playing like a handheld video game. It's like a 2D like platformer of a rat collecting cheese while trying to avoid bombs. And he's running away from a snake who eventually catches up to him, which I thought was kind of on the nose. <laughs> it's like the exact situation that he's in right now. <laughs> so anyway, it was funny, though. But um, besides like the funny parts, like I was pretty disappointed that Monkey got killed off. Like, yep, I was going to so interesting. bring it up. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, like I really liked her backstory. Like, I really liked her whole like pacifism plan. And we're never gonna know what her plan was. Like, maybe she never really had like a good plan to get everybody out of line, but she out alive. But she seemed really confident that she could, uh, and never told that plan to anybody. Maybe she told it to Rat. Maybe we'll find out from Rat later on. But it just seems like a plotline cut short. Um. But, like, speaking of Rat, like, having watched, having not watched anything ahead of this episode, like, I've seen speculation, but, like, I I am convinced that Rat is going to win now. Like, and just for reasons based on, like, who is writing this show, because, <laughs> like, Nisio Eason is writing this, and, like, he his, like, whole thing is writing characters who, like, get in your head and like twist words and like use words as weapons. Um, and rat is like the one in the show who embodies that more than anybody else. Uh, yeah, maybe his only competition was monkey, but she's dead now. Yeah, for sure. And so like, I mean, ox is like an all powerful, but like, and then like, apparently like the, the story of the Chinese Zodiac is that like the rat rides on the back of the ox and all the way to victory. Like, so like, that's probably what's going to happen. But like, I'm, I'm curious now. It's like, is this story going to try and subvert that of the Chinese Zodiac or is it just going to follow it? Exactly. I don't know. But hmm. uh, it's still yeah. a fun ride either way. Like, even if you know who's dying next, I still think this is kind of fun just because like they die yeah. in such brutal and fun ways. I, I just, I don't care who wins. I'm not even really rooting for anybody. I just want rabbit to fucking die. <laughs> yeah i want to like understand rabbit a little bit better before he dies though but then yeah he well, can everybody's die. getting gets a backstory in an episode so we'll see his yeah in uh, uh, next episode the backstory is on uh snake and dragon okay exciting and it's it's like it's a huge amount it's like half the episode oh it's interesting. not that important <laughs> so yeah I, so you got an easy review coming up for the next one okay that's exciting <clears throat> yep well, moving on from Junie Tyson on Thursdays, we've got Just Because, episode uh, five. Great show. It's called Rolling Stones. It just keeps getting better. Uh, the episode opens with Haruto and Eita. Like, they're both really depressed that winter break is over. And they have to go back to school and face Hazaki and Mio, respectively. Like, Hazaki, who just, like... Uh, rejected Haruto and Mio who had like a really intense conversation with Eita at the end of the other episode. So yeah, they're both not looking forward to that. Um, Mio's friend Momiko notices her, her staring at Eita when he arrives at school and she regrets going, like Mio regrets going too far in her conversation with Eita and like wants to like apologize to him. And Momiko like jokingly asks her like, wait, do you like both Haruto and Eita? She's kind of teasing. Um, but anyway, Haruto is playing it off in class like, oh, I'm totally fine. He's just joking with his buddies, which is really off-putting to Hazaki's friends Yoriko, who is whispering to her like, doesn't he realize he's been dumped like because he's acting so natural? But I can say from experience, I know like guys who totally did this in high school when they got rejected, like because you have to go and face 
the girl you got rejected by in class the next day. Like, so like the thing you'll do is like, oh yeah, no, there was nothing. It was nothing. I'm totally fine, guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> it usually doesn't last forever, but like you try to put on this front that like, oh, it's not affecting me at all when you're like still like churning on the inside. Uh, Haruto's friend Junpei is jealous that he's like Haruto has like a job lined up for after graduation already. Um, but Haruto like it doesn't feel the same way at all. He thinks to himself that Junpei and the other guys are like going to get into college and they're the ones who actually have a future ahead of them. He's jealous of them. So Mio's friends give her like a fortune for good luck with her entrance exams and then also another one for success in love because they're very much trying to prod her into making a move on Haruto. And they're like, I mean, she's like, well, I need to go off somewhere and do something. They're like, oh, you're going to Haruto? And there she's like, oh, no, it's something like that, though. And so she heads off towards Eita instead uh, because she wants to apologize to him. Uh, Meanwhile, Aina, photographer girl, is searching around school and she finds the spare room that Eita has been using as a place to, like, avoid everyone (laughs) Uh, and, like, annoys him there. Haruto cleans out his baseball locker. Uh... And he's carrying his glove around and thinking everything's over. Uh, he's just like really depressed because like baseball's ending, school's ending. He's going off to this job that he's going to work for the rest of his life. And he got rejected by the girl he loves. So he's pretty depressed. <laughs> Unfortunately, when Mio goes to talk to Ada, she sees Aina with him and hides immediately. And he actually notices her, though, just barely, but walks away because he's still like doesn't feel like talking to her. Aina asks him, like, hey, why are you running away from Mio? Uh, but before answering, he sees Haruto walking out of school dejectedly, and he kind of traces back that path he was walking from and goes to, like, this waste disposal room and finds that Haruto just threw his baseball glove on the top of a dumpster. But he picks it up and takes it with him. Yoriko, who's turning out to be one of my favorite characters in this show, uh, meets up with, like, Mio and Hazuki, like, on a train after school. Uh... And they're like trying to cheer them up a bit by asking Mio like, hey, what happened with Ada? And asking if she's jealous that he was like flirting with Aina, which she denies. She denies it at first. But Yoriko like basically knows better. And she tells her that like, hey, Haruto's ship sunk with Hazuki anyway. So so you should be happy. And like Hazuki is like right there and like bumps her like, hey, stop talking about that. But like Yoriko is like, guys, like we both know everything going on here. So just let's get it out in the open. So it's nice to have a friend like that who is perceptive enough to like say what the quiet reserved types can't bring themselves to spit out. Um, Ada brings Haruto's glove home with him and like looks at his own glove, which had this like quote that they had written when they played baseball together, which was like, until the last ball, which is a really lame quote, but whatever. Uh, He asks Haruto to hang out and they end up going to this pickup softball game, which is with a bunch of Haruto's future co-workers, colleagues at the factory that he's going to work at. Um, Meanwhile, Hazuki asks Mio to go to a cafe so they can just talk about Haruto and kind of hash things out. Uh, And Hazuki says, like, I rejected Haruto for a few reasons. Like, first, like, we didn't really talk a lot before he asked me out. And, like, I don't know enough about him. And second, like, I'm leaving town after graduation, so I'm not even going to be in the same area. But even so, even with all that, she feels like she kind of answered him too quickly and would like to give him, like, a more of a proper answer. And Mio tells her, like, yeah, you should do that. You should just respond to him properly because he'll probably see it as good news that like you're still thinking about it so someone lends haruto a glove to play with at the softball game but it doesn't feel right to him luckily ada brought along haruto's actual glove and gives it back to him where did he have that glove i assumed he went and got it out of his bag but like you're right he kind of like just disappears for a second and has the glove like (laughs) Like he just pulled out of his ass. I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) I saw your comment on that. I was like, I went back and watched that scene. I was like, "Eh, yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But so Haruto's like, whoa, dude, you're really scary. (laughs) Because like he just threw away the glove. He didn't know like anybody was watching him do it. So he's like freaked out that he has it. But he's just really happy. He makes like a diving catch in right field. And then like they go out with the coworkers after the game. And like the coworkers are all getting like super drunk and stuff. But like he figures out like hey these are like really fun guys and like working with them is gonna be a really fun time like i don't have to like be so sad that i'm not going to college and stuff like this could still be a good like way for me to live true um so yeah and so like he's what was i gonna say 
he bumps into his mom, Haruto, on the way home. And she, like, is happy to hear that he's, like, got more of a brighter outlook now on his future. And he asks her, like, aren't you, like, always sad? Because, like, you're, like, constantly busy and working hard. And she's like, oh, yeah, it's annoying sometimes. But there are some good things. And he's like, what? And she's like, well, when your son carries things for you. (laughs) Which she's like, you'll understand that when you become a parent. (laughs) So... Meanwhile, Eita, like, stopped by this random bookstore to buy a book with information about various colleges and bumps into Mio, of all people, on the way home, which he wasn't quite ready for. And they're, like, riding the same bus on their way home, and she apologizes to him, and he apologizes to her for everything they said. And she clears up with him that it made her upset, like, when he told her, like, you know, I was using studying as an excuse not to make things clear to Haruto. And she's like... Not because of anything you said, but I've decided I'm going to make things clear to him soon. So she gets off at her stop and then Ata is just like left like, wait, so did she understand like when I said like I'm involved that I meant that I like love her? Or does she not understand? Like what the hell did that even mean? So he's still left with a misunderstanding. But uh, yeah. Uh, anything on that episode before I move on? Uh, I'm calling total bullshit on two uh, girls, high school girls discussing... Uh, a calm situation about the same boy they like. <laughs> well, does Hazuki know that Mio likes him though? Because like I feel like if Hazuki knew, then she would be way more reserved. She probably wouldn't talk to her. But I don't think Mio has like let anyone really know. Well, her friends definitely know. Yeah, I think in the I think in their conversation, I don't know. I have a hard time paying attention to this show because it's so boring. But I'm pretty <laughs> sure they both said they liked the same guy. I don't. I don't think so. No, me. I don't think Mio has told Hazaki like how she feels about Haruto. I don't. Well, but maybe I don't know. I felt it's like confusing. She, knew. she may know, and so like Hazaki is sort of like asking like, "Hey, I, I don't know what to do about these feelings." Like, I don't know. It, yeah, if if Hazaki does know, then I do have kind of a problem with it, like you're saying. Like if she, but it wasn't like incredibly clear to me that she's like a hundred percent sure. That, uh, because like maybe Hazuki thinks that she yeah, likes Ata. One of them know. does know, so <laughs> yeah, Mio knows, and so like Mio is like subjecting herself to like all this pain, like mm-hmm. cheering Hazuki on, like for the boy that she likes, which is yeah, that's not great. <laughs> so, uh, episode six though is called Restart. Uh, so Hazuki, I'm oh, sorry, Haruto you doesn't know how to respond. Like you're an auctioneer, <laughs> I can't so read that. So, we can fast. be done with this. Haruto doesn't know how to respond to Hazuki's text, text asking to talk to him and hasn't responded for like three days and like Hazuki's like what the hell am I supposed to do he won't respond meanwhile Eita despite having like a recommendation for a university already is now studying for some strange reason um, the Amazon sub said his book is for Joe University like so apparently he bought a book in the last episode and it was for like Joe University. That was what the sub said. And that's like, I had to look into this very carefully because like the kanji was different on the second book that he had in this episode. And it's kind of important. Um, so I saw someone on Reddit say like, this was a mistranslation. The book that he's studying on the library in this episode, which like the subs say it's like the Joe University book. But I went to like my friend, Buddy Mason, who is like my go-to kanji decipherer, who got on this case, and it turns out that like the book that Ata bought at the last end of last episode did say Joe University, but the one that he's studying from in the library is actually Suizan University, which is a completely different school and a completely different kanji. So Amazon screwed up the subs there. And so Aina finds him studying from this like college like test prep book in the library and he instantly hides it because he doesn't want her to know that he's studying for like a different university um, from the one that he got a recommendation for. Because like why would he be if he already had a recommendation? And we'll find out later in the episode why he was. Uh, so Like, I had thought that, like, maybe he's studying because Mio teased him about having a recommendation in an earlier episode, and he just wants to impress her or possibly go to the same college as her, which is, I think, what it turns out to be. Um, And in the conversation with Aina, we learn that the book he's studying from is Mio's first choice of school, and Aina is trying to become friends with Ada to get him to sign off on that picture 
though she's like flirting with him pretty hard now, giving him food that she made from her bento. And like Haruto walks in on them and gets like really like freaked out, wondering like, when did Ada get to first base? But uh, Ada just like clears it up immediately that it's not like that. Even though he's like really letting Ada like flirt with him. He's, he's not like telling her to go away. So Haruto tells Ada he's scared of making things clear with Hazuki, which is why he won't talk to her. And Mio and Hazuki both spot Haruto and Ada as they walk outside school to chat. And Ada tells Haruto, hey, we're going to have another one at bat game. Uh, and if you hit a home run, then you need to go talk to Hazuki and make things clear. And Ada is definitely taking this like at bat way more seriously than the first one we saw in the series. He throws the first pitch like right at Haruto's head and then throws a curveball for a strike one. And so Haruto asks him, like, hey, you're taking this seriously. What are you going to do if you win? And then Ada's like, fine, I'll make things clear, too, meaning he'll tell Mio how he feels. So he gets a strike, two on a foul ball. And then Mio is, like, out on the grounds, like, looking on. And Hazuki is, like, at a window on the second floor looking on. And Aina is out there as a stalk, like the stalker she is, taking more photos. So Haruto just s- starts fouling off like a series of endless pitches, like battling to try and win this at bat. And like Hazagi sees him trying so hard and she knows like what he's doing. And so she runs from the window and like runs to her band practice room and takes out her trumpet. But before she even gets a chance to like go and play it, she was going to go play his like theme for him. Uh, Haruto finally makes good contact and hits a home run. And like this time, Ata's like really defeated. Like he hangs his head because he wanted to win that at bat. And Ana sees this and wonders, like, what is that feeling that he's like going through? And Mio like sees all of this and thinks, I need to do my best too, inspired by the two of them. So Ana asks her clubmates, like, what the hell should I do about getting this picture from Ada? Like, I can't like get it from him. I've tried for weeks. And they tell her, well, it'd probably be best like to stop pushing and just back off. So uh, she finds Haruto and Eita leaving after school, uh, or sorry, Mio finds Haruto and Eita leaving after school, and she decides, like, I'm finally going to make things clear. And her way of making things clear is to just give Haruto the eraser back that he gave her in, like, middle school. And she's uh, <laughs> she's like, I'm repaying you. And then she doesn't say anything else. She's just like, I'm giving you back your eraser. And Haruto's like, what the hell was that about? <laughs> So Ada tells him, like, well, you figure it out. I'm not getting involved. So (laughs) Hazuki also, like, saw this happening now. So, of course, now she's unsure about whether it expressed her feelings to Haruto. So Hazuki is avoiding Haruto at school, despite him texting her and saying that he wants to talk now after that. And uh, Ana is now playing hard to get with Ada, hoping that it'll make him suspicious or jealous, but it's not having the desired effect. And Mio's friend tells her to hurry up and confess to Haruto or he's just going to be... Like he 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 might end up with Hazuki by the time she finishes her entrance exams, uh, and then at that point in the episode we see Ada running out of his house and he has an application form for Suizan University. So this like completes that link from before, like where the Amazon subs messed it up and said that the book was for Joa University. No, he's applying to the same school that Mio is going to, even though he already has a recommendation for other school. So meanwhile. Yoriko spotted Hazuki playing trumpet by the river and took the liberty of calling Haruto to like come by. And so like she puts them together and leaves them alone right there. Yeah. Nice, nice wingman. Yoriko is by far like my favorite character right now. (laughs) She's just like moving things along. Um, He asks her like, can you play that song for me? Like the one that you always play during the baseball tournament. And uh, she, she plays it on the trumpet even though she says i really suck she's fine um and then the ultimate stalker Ana is like somehow taking pictures of this too and then like other stuff around town um and Ana's hazuki tells wait what'd you say i said she's best girl you know Ana. Oh, yeah i like her too she's really cute uh hazuki tells haruto that she she wants him to give her some more time to think over her response to his confession and like as she's trying to tell him like don't get your hopes up because my college is really far away. He just like screams at the top of his lungs like, hell yeah, <laughs> ridiculously. Yeah, I at think. this point I was like, tone it down there, Soma. Tone <laughs> yeah, it down. He's like, like a psychopath. Like, like I, I don't know. Like that was a little over the top. <laughs> but like, I guess like after getting rejected and like having everything in your life sort of start going wrong and then or you feel like it's going downhill. And then to have her say, like, no, there's actually a shot. Like, I could see him being pretty excited. 
but not maybe not that excited. Yeah. <laughs> On the way home, Ada spots Ana, who's getting scolded by cops for taking an unwanted picture of some guy on the street, which is what something she would do. Uh, but meanwhile, no, Mio, he claims she took a picture of him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile, Mio is happy for Hazaki, who sees via line messages uh, that um, she finally got in touch with Haruto and is talking again. And when she gets off her bus, it's snowing. Uh, and she like looks and like the first thing she sees is that Ata is like on a motorcycle with Ana holding him from behind. And she basically just says like, what the fuck? <laughs> so like there's like a series of like misunderstandings at this point. But like these, I don't know, like it's not like gamers, though, where like the misunderstandings are the story. This like gamers was like misunderstandings. La ha ha. Let's all laugh at it. This one is more like there's a group of people who don't want to like step on each other's feet in this situation like Hazaki and Mio both want the same guy and they both sort of know it to some extent and they don't want to like step on each other's feet and then like the whole Aina and Ada thing is clearly like I don't know Ata needs to take Ada needs to make that situation clear before anything uh, because I think he's kind of enjoying having all the attention from Ada in in the end but um mm-hmm. But yeah, people need to just make things clear. And that's like something I liked about Tsukigakure when I watched that was that there were a whole bunch of opportunities for misunderstandings. But at every given juncture where it could have been a tropey misunderstanding, they made things clear. Like one of my favorite uh, parts of that show was when the, the lead character like saw like they're at the amusement park and like he sees like the girl like going off with another guy and he like goes up and he says, fuck that, takes her by the hand and says, she's with me and then walks off. I was like, yes, thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> that this this series needs a moment like that coming up soon, I would say. So I, I don't understand why she can't use why he, she has to have permission to use his picture. Well, I don't know. There's probably like laws about that. <laughs> it, it must be. A, it has to be a Japanese thing. Because I mean, just look at the newspaper. People, mm-hmm. they don't have to ask permission for a picture of Donald Trump or nothing. So, yeah. Well, he's also a public figure, though. I don't know. But like private yeah, but figures, then like think, athletes. Yeah. And then there's like there's like uh, crowd shots with people in the background who you can clearly see who they are. And like, did they have to ask them? Well, I don't know. I know, like, when you're, like, releasing videos, like, you have to get, like, release forms from people. Like, I like Videos that's definitely different. Thing. We're talking yeah. about pictures here. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know what the law is on that in the United States. Because I, I know in L.A., there you have to have, like, you have to get permission from, like, establishments. It's literally law there to do any filming and, in, like, inside a store or something like that. So... Like, say you got just like you were in a picture and then that picture became really popular on some person's Instagram. Like, I guess you would probably have the right to ask them to take it down. Like, if you if they didn't get like a release from you. But like, I don't know how often something like that happens. Like, I have no I, idea. And the thing is, I've never really heard of it. So I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, the only other thing I have to say is my general stance on this show is I've already lived through awkward romances in high school <laughs> once. I would rather not do it again. And that's, I think it's just why I just don't, it, it's not like it's bringing up like past awkward memories or something. I'm just, mm-hmm. it's, I, I'm on, uncom- I'm bored. I'm really bored watching the show. I don't, if you, everybody hasn't figured out by now, I don't care for teen <laughs> romances at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's better when they're older people. I even tried to give convenience store boyfriends a chance and even you didn't really care for that one. So yeah, that was too bad. Yeah. I wish that had been better. But yeah, it's it's so rare that we get like actually like adult romances like in anime. So when it could, does come along, I really want the them. MMO to be good. junkie, she's thirty two. Oh, that one's just another series of misunderstandings. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I've been it's enjoying not it. misunderstandings. It was flat out people not knowing other people, and they are uh, taking care of all that. So that's love true. It. That's true. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right, you want to move on to the next show? Sure. Let's move on to Inuyashiki, The Last Hero, Episode 5, Yuko Shishigami. We open with Ando watching the news that is discussing last episode's events. They briefly touch on the Yakuza's being attacked before moving on to another family that was murdered last night. Uh, they speculate the object that is being used is a firearm, but there have been no bolts found or black powder residue. 
Ando starts to become very scared because he knows who exactly exactly is capable of doing this. Ando begins to search the internet for body machines with no clear direction. Uh, he's just trying to figure something out what he can do. What happens is he stumbles upon some posts of people being miraculously healed from one hospital to the next. After speculating for a bit, he comes to the conclusion there must be others out there like Hero. But instead, they are healing instead of killing. He thinks they might be able to stop Hero. He remembers they can hear everything and like starts running around his room and saying he's going to be killed. And he's like flopping around <laughs> for a minute. And then he gives up. But then the door calm goes off and he runs outside to find Ichiro standing there. Uh, they go to Ando's room and talk about how they have to stop Hero, even if it means possibly killing him. Uh, it's also a really good scene where Ando calls Ichiro a hero and like he's really touched by it and it was so good uh it was cool i I just want to say one thing about that scene uh just like like at some point in that scene he's like i will follow you for like the rest of my life (laughs) i was like wow that was quick (laughs) but like also like i understand where he's he's coming from though yeah like he he's like trauma traumatized by like his friend becoming this monster and like he he really believes in like the opposite of what Hero is yeah. doing, and he so. just now found what might be his actual solution to the problem. Yeah. So, like, yeah. of course, he's he's this is going to have an emotional impact on him. <laughs> so, at school, Hero gets a love confession from a girl who he refers to as Pubehead. Well, he says that that's what everybody calls her, and it's just this show has done so many moments where like they almost rationalize or make the guy not seem so bad but then they'll just do this this quick 20 second scene and it just makes you re-hate this guy so much more (laughs) with so much rage and it's i just love the writing in the show it's insane so anyways she confesses and he just says thank you and walks away (laughs) what a fucking dickwad yeah well he's got bigger things to do like kill people (laughs) (laughs) oh my no anyways so we found out, or I just missed earlier on, that Hero's parents are separated. Uh, he goes to his dad's house, who has remarried, and he is there to celebrate his younger stepbrother's birthday. And he also has a younger stepsister, too. His dad seems to be very well off with money. His house is super nice, especially for a, a Japan house. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, his mother's not doing so well. They're barely making by living in the apartment they're in. When Hero returns to his mother's, she has something to tell him. She found she found out that day that she has pancreatic cancer and they told her she only has a month to live. So, you know, a Hero, you know, we know we can cure this. You know, he cries and hugs her and then he does his thing and, you know, takes care of her cancer and then also admits to himself that, you know, he's going to stop killing, I think was this part. Yeah, like before they go to sleep, he like, she's like asleep and she sa- he says like out loud, I'm going to stop killing like, well, he, I think they they also they have that like brief conversation at the like dinner table about like they're watching TV, mm-hmm. and she's like, "Oh man, this killer! Like he should just go straight to hell." Yeah, and he, he, says, he asked, "Yeah, well, what if it was me?" Yeah, and then she's and like, she's "I would like, die with you, I guess." Then yeah, she's like, I, "Then I feel his mother, and I would you know die with you because she feels like this murder obviously needs to die, needs death penalty." Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time. Ando and Ichiro go to a junker late at night so Ichiro can train and learn to use his powers. He gets nowhere at first, but eventually learns to open his arm up and fire the weapon that leaves a large crater in the ground. It's like a humongous crater. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's it, like the way Ichiro reacts to every time he discovers a new ability of his always just it just cracks me up because I think it's an <laughs> honest reaction to he's not necessarily old, but he's what was it, 65? He's yeah, he's up there. He's a retiree, probably. <laughs> yeah, but the and and the thing is, like you know, older people are kind of out of sync with like technology. So sure. of course, it's going to like blow their minds way more than it's going to blow ours. So <laughs> <laughs> then we just do another quick scene with Watanabe. This is a pubeg girl uh, watching Hero as he answers a call from his mother without a phone in his hand. He just does you know the the thumb and the pinky thing, and <laughs> mm-hmm. and she just knows something's going on. Uh, Hero then moves his mom into a much nicer apartment, saying he got the money from uh, doing day trading. Yeah. But we know very well he's just manipulating ATMs. Yeah. 
Uh, and just another really quick scene where Ando and Ichiro go to a hospital and he heals a sick boy and Ando's like really touched again emotionally. Mm-hmm. Then there's this, I, I don't, didn't figure the scene out. There's a weird scene where Hiro gets a paper cup, pa- paper cut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He got a paper cup at the, uh, like the drink <laughs> he station. He got a paper yeah. cut and jumps around <laughs> happily because he says he's human again. What yeah, that did was- I miss? Uh, maybe, maybe since he's, maybe this is what his thought process is. Like he told himself early in the episode, like, I'm going to stop killing. And then maybe that getting a paper cut was like a sign to him. Like, like, Oh, like God is going to let me like stop being this machine thing. Like I'm, I'm human again. Like everything's going to be all right. Like that's, that's kind of what I got out of that. Okay. Okay. I can take that. Um, the show then ends on the government agents going to Hero's house as they lay, as they're laying down to sleep. And just before Hero goes to sleep, he says he won't kill anymore. Oh, so they, wait, that's when that happens. Oh, I thought that's that happened when that earlier. happens. Yes. Okay, so then then I really don't know. <laughs> he says this because there was an earlier conversation between between him and his mother about the killings that we kind of talked about. Right. Uh, the agents storm the place. Hero jumps out the back window, but the house is surrounded by agents, and one of the agents yells, "Everybody, attack him at once!" And I literally <laughs> clapped because. <laughs> I, I said something earlier how people attack one at a time. I'm like, why don't they all ever attack at once? And they no, take care of like I, when I was watching that scene, there was like one guy in the crowd who's like, I'll take him. And then everybody's like, no, attack at once. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, thank you. Uh, they take care to the ground. And that's how the episode ends. I'd also like to note it's fucking like the middle of the day. What were they doing laying down to go to sleep? <laughs> yeah, that was weird. I don't know. Ever since I learned about that Batman scene where he he goes into the tunnel and it's daytime and when he comes out, it's suddenly nighttime. Like, (laughs) I guess I just watch for that shit now. (laughs) Uh, And like, I'll say like one of the important aspects of that last scene is that like he lets himself get taken down because Mm -hmm. his mother is watching and like he doesn't want her to know what he's become. Like, so yeah, like he's looking back at her and he's like distraught. Uh, so yeah, that's where episode six begins, which is called People of Two Chan. <laughs> oh God. Your comments cracked me up when I was reading this, dude. <laughs> oh God. Here we go. This is an interesting one. Like this was a fun episode actually. Yeah. So yeah. Hero, like he uses his strength to break free from the cops eventually. Like even though his mother is watching, he's just like, he uses like some brute strength to just like get free. And as soon as he like rounds the corner and as soon as he's out of his mom's line of sight, he launches himself into the air well, and flies I away. I want to say he does the good old scene where you uh, like, you see your, your hero and all the bad guys jump on him and yeah. then you're like, oh no. And then he bursts out like <laughs> yeah. it, Matrix. It's in all kinds of stuff, but like that's exactly what he does. <laughs> yeah and so like he once he lands like and you can see he doesn't care about other people seeing him because he like lands in the middle of like town and there's like people walking around and they see him it's, it's only his mom that he cares about seeing him like that uh and he runs into pube head or uh shiori watanabe once he lands uh so like yeah his classmates are shocked to hear the news because like it's all over the news now that he is like this killer uh, and they're all thinking like, oh, man, he was such a good guy. Like, I wouldn't imagine him doing this. Um, but the one girl says, like, even though you're a good guy, it doesn't mean you won't kill someone. So anyway. Oh, we also didn't say it was Ando who gave the cops the information. They yeah. showed us how, which was yeah. interesting because, you know, Hero can monitor everything. So. Yeah, I agree. Like, there's some times when he's talking with uh, Ichiro where I'm like, you know, Ando, like, Hero could be listening in on all this, but mm-hmm. I guess he doesn't suspect his friend. So, yeah. Um, Hero goes to at first who we think is just an old woman's house to hide out, but we later find out it's uh, Shiori's um, grandmother. Uh, so, in his mind, he brings up these like inter- this internet video of like a news broadcast where like they're like going into his background. They're talking about like what could have caused him to create these murders. And like, they're like, Oh, well we found that he killed animals as a child. And that's a very big indicator. And also his parents are separated, which could mean that he has a complicated home life, which could be the reason for him murdering at least 15 people. (laughs) So like the news is trying to make sense of all this essentially in the way that they always do. Um, no, he's just he's just fucked up in the head. Yeah, he's Sorry. just a psychopath. Yeah, uh, Shuri says it's all right for Hero to stay. Um, he asks, like, are your parents coming home? But apparently, both of her parents died of cancer. Uh, and Shuri says, like, I probably won't live a long time either because of that. 
Um, so he eats, he eats dinner with her and her grandmother. And in that scene, like the grandmother confirms that like she never watches television. So she's not going to find out about the news. Yep. Um, and that night hero silently goes to Ichiro's home and like, he's like really distraught by all this stuff that's going on on the news and everything. So he goes to Ichiro's home, like literally into his bedroom and points the finger gun at his head, but he what? doesn't. Sh- yeah. It's, no, it's, he, he does it to the grandma and the, uh, the, I thought uh, for sure it was Ichiro. I thought no, for sure. And, uh, the girl, Watanabe or whatever. Maybe it was the grandma. Maybe the grandma just looked like Ichiro and I got confused. It was the grandmother and Wat- Watanabe. And her daughter. Okay, 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 fine. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so like- he goes into their bedrooms <laughs> and like, because I was like, why the fuck did he go to Ichiro's house and like point a gun at his head and then not shoot? But anyway, so yeah, he goes to, he goes into the grandmother's room and he goes into Shiori's room and like points his like finger gun at their heads, but like doesn't fire. And like, I just want to say, if he had killed Shiori, I would have 100% refused to watch this show anymore. Because, like, she's already called Pubehead. You can't fucking kill her, too. Like, come on. That's too that's too <laughs> mean. Come on, guys. Well, so, I don't think uh, that would have even offered anything to this story at that point. Yeah, I, even I would have so been bad. like, well, what the fuck? Why? Yeah. It, I like to know that he contemplated the idea because, you know. Yes. They, they Those two know where he's hiding out. But... That and like, but like, because they've like showed him kindness and like, because he kind of promised to himself to stop killing, like he's so far, he's sticking to what he said to himself. Correct. Um, so Ando shows Ichiro that beneath his fingernail is a USB port that he can use to connect to a device like a phone. Cause like Ando remembers Hero like saying, I put my phone in my head cause it's just easier. Um, so like now that they've like synced it up, like Ando can now talk to Ichiro when he's flying around. So Ichiro is like flabbergasted by this amazing cell phone technology. So they test it out by having Ichiro fly like as high as he can before he starts losing cell signal. And like they get above like an airplane and they're still like talking clearly to each other. Then somehow he still has signal even when he's in outer space. <laughs> Which... well, well, once he got past the airplane, Ando was like, well, I guess cell towers aren't even, don't even matter at this point. But man, yeah. when he was in space, and that astronaut was looking at him. Yeah. You just know that astronaut sitting there going, I am long overdue for a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> that astronaut's being like, do I report this? Because I probably like lose my career if I report this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that would be pretty funny. They'd be like, oh, you're seeing old men in with no shirts flying around in space. Um, <laughs> where have you come back on the next shuttle? <laughs> I think it's, I was thinking about it because, like, I think most of the time astronauts do spacewalks. They have like a camera on their helmet, so like you know the NASA or like Houston can see like what's going uh, on. So I was yeah. like. Wait, they would probably have like footage of this guy like back at NASA. They're probably <laughs> like, what NASA's the hell? Going, uh, everybody saw the man too, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Fred, you saw that, right? <laughs> like, oh no, I was eating a donut, John. Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, geez. So anyway, Hero sobs as he watches his mother being interviewed on television. And like, she's apologizing for her son doing something that no human should ever do. She says, and like, she just says like, I don't know how I should be taking responsibility for my son's actions. And so he's like sobbing, watching her, his mother go through this. And then, so he starts scrolling the online forum two chan, which is like the Japanese four chan, or I guess four chan is like the American two chan or what the weather, the Western two chan, whatever. Uh, she looks uneducated, they say, and they, they are like, look at her house. And like, obviously the parents are guilty too. These are all comments that they're making and seeing all these mean comments directed at his mother starts to piss him off, but he doesn't do anything about it yet. Um, but Ando sees this too and starts worrying like, Oh God, he's going to kill somebody if this continues. And like Etro is like, okay, I'll try to listen to, to him. Let's try and stop him before he kills somebody else. And so that night hero is kind of like relaxing, just trying to like wind down. He's watching a variety show. And he's finally laughing and like relaxing again. And then breaking news appears on the screen that says mother of suspected serial killer has committed suicide. So that was her way of taking responsibility for her son's actions. And so he like lays still for like just a moment and then gets up with dead eyes, walks like slowly out of the apartment and like launches up into the night sky and just starts screaming in agony when he's out of like hearing range. 
So the next morning, his father is being interviewed and Hero shows up and just starts shooting indiscriminately into this crowd of reporters, all who are surrounding his father, slaughtering every single last one of them. He even uses his finger gun as like a machine gun. He puts it like into like he's carrying like an imaginary machine gun. (laughs) Instead of just saying bong, bong, it's like and it acts like a machine gun. So his father is the only one left standing there and asks Hero like, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. Because he thinks his son has just completely lost his mind, which he has. But Hero blasts away, leaving his father alive. Um, and so he walks around the city just brazenly. And in his mind, he's looking at these 2chan forums, right? And he starts posting as himself, saying, I'm going to kill everyone who's talking shit about my mom. So one poster, whose like anonymous number is like 325, says like, uh, he says, like, I found you. Uh, I'm coming for you. And so we see this man in his bedroom, like with anime posters on his walls, like in glasses and like unkempt hair. And he's like saying to himself, well, what is this kid going to do? I'll kick his ass. And then so Hiro then appears on this guy's phone, like as a video. And then says, like, oh, this won't work. And then he just moves over to the PC monitor screen. So like it's like a video feed of him. And so he asks, like, are you the guy who released, uh, like, my picture and my home address to the media? And the man, like, who's kind of, like, a little touched in the head seeing this, like, doesn't believe it. He starts laughing and yelling, like, oh, mom, mom, come look. It's like Shishigami. He's on the TV. And he still doesn't think any of this is real. And he asks Hiro, like, just, you can release whatever you want. Just don't release my Lollicon porn folder because that would be an issue. Mm. So Hiro then says, bang. And fires from the PC monitor into his room, which fires like a shot into the television behind the man. And the man like looks around. He's like, huh, this must be some kind of weird TV show. Like I've seen. And then like hero fires fires again, except this guy time into the guy's thigh. And now he's like screaming in pain. And he's like, I was just trolling. <laughs> oh, God. God. And he says, like, I didn't send anything to the media. I didn't. And then I just did it to impress the other two channers and stuff. And so Hero then like flashes on the screen the email that this guy sent to the media because he knows he's lying. Uh, and so the guy likes, like, please take, take mercy on me or whatever. And Hero just opens fire, um, starts shooting at him. And the man like goes to hide behind like a coffee table and like he puts his head up just a little bit and realizes there's an open laptop sitting on the table and Hero like goes over to that laptop screen and just fires the killing blow right through his eyes. He then releases a video from like the computers, like the point of view that he had of killing this guy to two chan and he says like i'm coming for all of you and one by one in order of like their anonymous number on the forum uh in that like thread about his mother he goes and just kills every single person from two chan like through their cell phone or through their computer or their laptop ending with like the 522nd post like he kills every single one of them yeah he also they also showed the trolls being people of like all walks of life yeah like businessmen like they didn't show any of them female did they i doubt it i don't think so i don't remember any i don't think so but they would show like an office worker or then just like some dad and just all all the randomness yeah and a bunch of them were like giving like middle fingers to the screen, like, ha ha, come and get me, you asshole. And then they would just die. <laughs> yep. So, sure yeah, will. that was a pretty edgy episode. <laughs> Killing all of 2chan. I think you've called every episode edgy. <laughs> they are. They are so edgy. But uh, uh, I, I enjoyed this one because it was so kind of over the top and ridiculous. What's that you said? Uh, They're also seeing internet trolls get murked wasn't the worst thing ever. <laughs> yeah, like giving the current political climate, like I, I did not, I can't say I didn't enjoy seeing this like mass slaughter of like assholes on the internet. So, yeah. Not that I condone something like that. I'm just saying like in fiction, it's kind of fun to see. So, yeah, well said. All right. Go to the uh, next show. Sure. Okay. All right. Like we talked about before on Fridays, we got recovery of an MMO junkie. Uh, episode five is called the secret triangle. So, uh, while we thought that Yuta had put it together, that Moriko was Hayashi at the end of last episode, at the beginning of this one, he concludes, eh, coincidences like that don't really happen, do they? 
<laughs> so he's like still unsure if it's really her. Um, so Homare continues to tease Yuto about his upcoming date with Moriko. He even asks Yuta if he wants to come and eventually says like the only reason I asked her out was to help you, you know, because he, he just like is like constantly teasing his friend about this. It's pretty bad. But like if Yuta, I mean, like I can understand that, like if your friend had the same reaction that Yuta did and kept like denying that he has feelings for this girl, you would probably tease him, too. So <laughs> uh, Morika is like freaking out about not having nice clothes and she's at the convenience store and she runs into the guy at the counter who like reintroduces himself as uh, Kazuomi Fujimoto. And they get to talking and they find out that the, they play on the same server uh, in Kalmar is the name of the server in the MMO game. And he tells her like his in-game name and then her jaw just drops because obviously it's somebody she knows very well. Back in the game, she talks with Lilac, who says she's going to play with her in real life friend a little later. It's a girl who goes to the same college as her. And... Uh, Coincidentally, that girl also plays as a guy online as well. So Moriko is like trying to like test the waters. So she asks her like, do you think it's creepy? Like, did you think it was creepy when you found out your friend played as a guy? And Lilac's like almost offended just by being asked that question and says like people can play however they want. And Lilac leaves when Kanbei shows up and uh, she misunderstands the situation. It's thinking that like, Oh, wait, Hayashi is actually a guy who wants to play as a girl. That's what's going on. But no, that's not it at all. Uh, so it turns out that Kanbei from the guild is Fujimoto, the convenience store guy in real life. And so he talks with Moriko about the situation now that it's all out in the open. And he tells her, like, I think it's fine that you hid the truth like about who you are off um, offline because like everybody has their own secrets. Um they decide not to tell anyone how that they know each other in real life or about her secret. And Kanbe vaguely tells Moriko, like, you're probably better off not asking Lily for real life advice, though, just so you know. Mm -hmm. Moriko doesn't know what to think about, but nonetheless, she goes right ahead and asks Lily in game, like, hey, what do you think would be proper fashion to wear for my date that I'm going on to get a drink? And Lily asks, when is this date? And Hayashi is like, oh, tomorrow. Uh, and this confuses Yuta, who knows that Homare's date, his friend, is the day after tomorrow, since he's on a business trip until then. So now he thinks that, oh, maybe Hayashi isn't Moriko after all. But things get thrown off again when Moriko asks, like, what Lily thinks a girl should wear to get drinks. And Yuta doesn't know how to answer this and changes the subject. And, like, Kanbei arrives, though, and is like, oh, no, Lily, you should really tell her what you should wear. And then you know, Yuta, like, whispers him immediately. And it's like, I just got off that topic. Why would you bring it back up? Um, and he's just like, dude, just tell her, like, how you would want her to dress as a guy. Like, it's easy. And then um, Lily and Kanbei get in a big fight about it. Like, what hairstyle that they prefer, though? Like, Kanbei likes short hair since it's, like, easier to manage, he says. And... Yuta says long hair is more romantic. It's cute and overflowing with possibility. So they're very, <laughs> they're very into their haircuts. Um, what, what is your preference, Becom? Um, I really don't have a preference. I think when I was growing up, I, I really used to like long hair, like long straight hair. Um, but now that I'm older, uh, I like all sorts of hairstyles. Like I really can't like say. I mean, I'm, I'm maybe not into like mohawks. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I agree. Uh, it, I think it depends on the girl. Like some people, some girls can pull off short hair amazingly well. Yeah, better than others. Uh, but my main preference is would be long hair, anyways. Even if some girl does look better with the shorter hairstyle, but mm -hmm. then you know, it's whatever. Yeah, I definitely don't mind if like uh, they're just gonna like experiment like every once in a while, every like few months, like with like a different hairstyle too. Like that's cool with me. So I don't know. Uh, but like, yeah, these guys are very set in their ways and what they think is best. Uh, so Moriko is all confused and she's like, she goes to a salon and it's like the, the salon is like, you know, uh, like we could give you short hair. Like you just put a little bit of wax on the ends. Um, but I, I, I prefer long, like does the salon prefer long hair? Right. I think, I think she does. So it was like two I, I on think one. She just tells her to, you know, go which, what she would think would be best. Yeah, and then Moriko's just like, can you give me a medium-length haircut? Because she can't decide. Uh, and so, like, she spends, like, at least $50 at the salon, and then she spends, like, hundreds of dollars on new clothes. 
Uh, and she's like, as she's doing this, she's like, I could have bought like 11 loot boxes for that dress. I could have bought like 15 loot boxes. So Yuta is worried enough, though, at that night about Moriko possibly having gone gotten the day wrong for their date if he's right about who she is. And so he like leaves the guild like right before a dungeon and like runs off. And he goes to the location where um, Homare was supposed to meet her and just to see if she's actually there. And she's been waiting for like an hour because uh, she did go. And so he's she's about to leave, but he finds her, shows up and like uh, even already uh, having waited an hour and like cons- and he confirms his suspicions and like stops her before she can leave. And that's the end of the episode. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, I just want to say uh, the chances you play with uh these people not only in your guild but then accidentally meet them in real life or like almost impossible chances <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that, that like all of these people in your actual guild and an mmo actually live in like your hometown and you're just bumping into all of them is the only way you're insane. gonna meet these people is one uh some of the people in our current guild i knew in real life beforehand and then we yeah. found out we played the same game and i'm like well shit let's do a guild together or number two you and me, we just went and met up one day because we've been hanging out for so long online. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not that like, like uh, <laughs> like some of the, let's just say the British guys, like they come over here, they didn't say anything, and then we just run into each other. Not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be pretty unlikely. Yeah. So, my super great. Uh, summarization of episode six which is only <laughs> two paragraphs that's okay which is titled i'm so embarrassed i could die which is what we we're supposed to turn over to but then when i skimmed through this google doc i'm like i think bcom has difficulty shortening his, <laughs> his summaries <laughs> yeah this week for whatever reason like i wrote really long summaries there's a lot like of it, stuff i wanted to talk about it, it literally looks hard for you when i'm looking at this doc like you just you're your fingers betray you and they start typing and you can't stop yeah like especially some of the next few episodes that we're going to get into after this like yeah Yeah. and i'm for me it's more about the episode like why i'm like this is just like a funny scene that has nothing to do with the plot so we skip it yeah for sure but anyways yuta and mariko meet and talk for a minute before homero calls and confirms that mariko had the wrong day he then plays some jokes on the two and gets you to say that uh, Mariko looks very cute and it's really not you you quoted this scene oh yeah like it was a good damn line because Yuta yep. says like on the phone like right now she looks so cute that I'm grateful you're not around to see it which that is a hell of a good line for a romance anime it's one of the better ones I've heard lately so I thought I'd point that out yeah and that should have been an arrow straight to Mariko's heart That's not, <laughs> come and on. it kind That's, of it was in a way yeah sure. yeah um, Homer ends the call with telling Mariko to enjoy the night with Yuta you know like he's encouraging them so they excuse me, go to a restaurant and like usual, the first couple of minutes are slightly awkward, but then the rest of the day is mostly Mariko feeling like there is a something familiar about Yuta, but she can't quite figure it out. She, I think uh, at some other point, she's like, Yuta reminds me of Lily's on for some reason. Yeah. But the next day, Mariko still goes on her date with Homura and it causes Mariko to remember some of the things she did with Yuta the night before. They also keep talking about Yuta and Homura seems to be trying to get Mariko to at least consider Yuta as dating material. Um, Mariko falls asleep at the table and Homura sends Yuta a pic teasing him. Yuta rushes to the restaurant and Homura questions Yuta about how he knew Mariko had the wrong day. Um, it just seems like right now that everybody seems to be slowly starting to figure out that they all know each other in real life and mm-hmm. from the game yeah and that's based that, I, that honestly that's just the whole gist of that episode <laughs> the rest of that is just it's just people talking yeah like i don't know we have like a little bit of like a love triangle sort of starting to develop but it's very clear that like moriko and yuta are gonna end up together but like yeah, and like i said homari he's like pushing moriko to you know date yuta so like I think yes. he's just having he, I think he's just having a little fun playing this game. I think that's his his big deal. Like he doesn't really want Mariko. He's actually a decent guy and he's looking out for his bud who he knows has an obsession with her. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, they keep bringing I, up the stalker joke and he's like, stop it. <laughs> I do want Moriko to find out about like who Yuta is because it kind of feels unfair that like he knows exactly who she is now. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I want him to tell her or like for her to find out from Kondo it'll, it'll or happen something. by the end. Yeah, um, of course it will. I just hope it happens in the next couple episodes so we can have like a little bit more development before the end. But I I still really like where the show is going. I was I was just thinking as you were talking, because like um, you you mentioned that part of the episode where um, Moriko looks at Yuta and thinks like, huh, I've seen somebody who looks like this before. And she's thinking about Lily in the game, like her face looks for whatever reason, the way they talk and the advice he gives reminds yeah. her of somebody else oh yeah it was something that he said that sounded mm-hmm. like something that because i was gonna say like we're not at that point where like you could just look at a character in an mmo and like know how they think but like no, i was no, no, no. i was thinking with like vr and like face tracking potentially in the future we could get to that point no which it would was be really some weird. advice he gave that was like crazy it cut because since he is lily it was you know basically the same advice and that's yeah. what she was like huh somebody gave me the exact same advice as somebody else did it was something like you're a really kind person or something like that um, i don't remember exactly yeah. but but yeah so the romance came's rolling on uh Yay. in that one so yeah let's get into this next show which is very interesting all right kino's journey the beautiful world the animated series episode five country of liars <laughs> uh Man, this would be a bad setting for Liar Liar because <laughs> it, it would not work out at all. All right. So Kino is getting a tour of a house that was memorialized in honor of a traveler that overthrew a corrupt government and used his knowledge for the benefit of the country. He's also dead now. Inside the house, <laughs> Kino sees a bunch of the travelers, travel gear and the guide ladies hyping it like all up. But most of it is just like your very standard travel gear, or just souvenirs. Like there was like a, he had like a, a small spade or a hoe mm-hmm. and like she hyped it up. And then like to himself, he's like, that was just the berry is crap. <laughs> yeah. She's like, this is what he used to dig up flowers. He loved flowers so much. And like her maze is like, yeah, no, he dig to dug that to like to craps <laughs> <laughs> yep yeah uh, uh but in the back room there's another motorad that used to talk just like hermes uh the two ask the guild lady to leave them alone to see if he'll talk to them he does and to him the place is a living hell saying motorads are meant to be ridden not cooped up uh he wants kino to either set him free or dismantle him kino can't do either without becoming an enemy of the country but before kino leaves he re- comes across a young boy who wants to like travel and stuff. And he tells him, well, maybe you should check out that motor ride in the museum about how to become one. If you want to be a, a traveler. (laughs) Yeah. So we know exactly what happened there. And that, I don't know. That was just like six minutes. Yeah. It was a weird brief introduction. We just move on to a completely different story. Yeah. And all I'll say about the first part of the episode is just like, I, I, I get that feeling of like, You know, like when you look at like car collectors and they have like a garage of like a hundred classic cars and like none of them are getting driven around because they're just like collecting value over time. Like instead of getting driven, like what was their, it's like their purpose was to be driven, but no. So I I get that philosophy, like use the thing, like, I don't know. But in the next country, Kino immediately runs to a man who was just seeing if his lover had come back yet from her travels. Uh, this country lim- doesn't really let their people leave unless under like special circumstances, basically. Uh, but then Kino heads into the town and starts inter- entertaining some people with stories from his travels. Uh, Hermes asks what was with- up with the guy at the gate and a friend of his for, for 10 years sits down to tell us that story. Also, when he met the guy at the gate, a woman came up, which was basically his caretaker and took him back to the house. But the story goes, the country used to be ruled by a tyrant king, and the man at the gates was the leader of the revolution that overthrew him. The thing is, he had fallen in love with a girl from the countryside that was in town selling vegetables one day. The two hit it off, and everybody thought they would marry eventually one day. But the day of the revolution, they stormed the castle, forcing the king to try and leave by car. Uh, Their leader threw a grenade and took out the king and his family. But in the wreckage, they saw that his lover was actually the princess, and she had been sneaking out of the castle. The leader couldn't cope with what he had done and basically went a little crazy. Now I'm going to start twisting some things up. The revolutionary leader has a housekeeper 
that we saw briefly. Uh, Kino, Kino talks to her and finds out she is actually the country's former princess. She was getting information from him and giving it to her father. It's what allowed them time to escape and in the car wreckage was just actually body doubles. Uh, the entire royal family had just escaped to a neighboring country this whole time. The thing is, she had really fallen in love with him and arranged it so she could come back and become his housekeeper. But I'm not done with a twist yet. When Kino <laughs> leaves, the revolutionary leader <clears throat> chases after him out of the gates. He knows his housekeeper is his former love, and him acting crazy is just a ruse because if he started acting normal again, then that would hint to other people. And he's very happy with how things are and wants them to stay the way they are, making everyone in the country a big fat liar. <laughs> For various different reasons, yeah. Yeah. Got anything you want to add? Oh, yes. Um, a lot. So first thing like the that I just want to point out is like the grieving man who's like hoping that his like lover will come back to him. He's voiced by uh, Akira Ishida, who I will never not recognize now because he's the voice of Yakumo from uh, Rakugo Shinju which is just, he did it was brilliant in that part. So it was fun to hear his voice again. But yeah, I really strongly disliked the second half of this episode. Uh, I loved it. I hated it. So the princess was spying on the revolution through this guy the entire time we learned. Yep. Without him knowing, uh, yep. which is how she's able to escape with the, the body double. And so she returns after three years and doesn't tell him that's his former lover. And uh, he also somehow doesn't recognize her, which they no, never- he does. Okay, that's true. He does recognize her, but pretends not to recognize her. Correct, because if he did suddenly become <clears throat> uncrazy, he's afraid the townspeople would catch on to something. Right. So she my somehow only, my only thing is her appearance. How does nobody recognize her? But he did. Maybe he she's changed her appearance. Well, maybe she's changed her hair a bit. Like she has like silvery hair. I don't know. Yeah. It's been three years, so but like you would still think that people would recognize her face, like if she was the princess. But maybe as the princess, she was mostly cooped up in the castle and they didn't see her. I don't know. But she's somehow okay living like this w- next to the man that she loves, who's who she she thinks is going crazy all the time looking for her when she's right next to him. Like also yep. assuming that they have a normal housekeeper employer relationship, she can never Love be intimate with the no man bounds, she loves. Be calm. <laughs> but like she can never be intimate with the guy she loves as long as she never tells I think him they're who being she is. Intimate. There's no indication there of that. There was some suggestion in there. Uh, uh, like maybe. he said, like <clears throat> he will have her until his true love comes back. It was something along those lines. Okay, so that that could be construed as them being intimate yeah. with each other. Yes. Okay. But yeah, okay, the final twist that the guy actually knows that it's his lover, but hasn't told her he knows. And that's because he wants to protect his friend who's a spy in the government and also maintain like the status quo of this new country that they've built. Like, it, like I just feel like this could all be solved by them talking to each other secretly. Like, and telling them each other that like, oh, I understand this is the situation, but I need to act like I'm crazy so you don't get outed. Like, Yeah, he only needs to act crazy for the townspeople. He could let her know. Yeah, there's no reason that they can't tell each other. That's why I was like so upset. It's like, just tell each other. But I don't know tell if he's each other. afraid that <laughs> he thinks they might be alone one time or something like that. Yeah. And he acts normal. So that's why he still acts crazy around her. I think that's probably it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's a it's a funny situation. I, did, because I honestly did not dwell on it too much until I read your notes. Mm-hmm. And then I just thought up some counter arguments for it. But no, yeah, I, and I, I, really I think that's it. what's good about this episode is that it is thought provoking. It's just like, mm-hmm. I, ah, it's such a weird situation, like to think that a person could be fulfilled, like living like five feet away from like the person they love, but not being completely truthful with them. Uh, but like being untruthful with them for their like well-being, apparently. But I don't know. It's a weird situation. <laughs> so but anyway, you want to go on to the, the next one? <clears throat> yeah, go to the next one. So episode six is called In the Clouds. And this episode is basically the ancient Magus Pride. <laughs> oh, my God. But seriously, it's an episode about a girl who has been taken as a slave as payment to some merchants when a country has like no many money to pay them with. And she's treated like incredibly poorly, um, being called like stupid slave by all these children running around this like merchant camp or this caravan. And she's thrown around by a chain attached to a collar on her neck, like with no regard to her well-being. Uh, And like two of the men at the camp, like the owner and one other guy asks like, 
do you hate your new owner owners or, or like the people who sold you? And she responds, uh, you must not hate others. That's the way of things. Like apparently they, they stole her away from kind of like religious nation who always believes in everyone else. That's like their biggest tenant is like, believe in everyone. Like, don't like distrust anyone. <laughs> Um, and the merchant presses her, telling her, like, you know, the world is a rotten place full of people who are just going to harm you at the drop of a hat. But she has this almost just fanatical belief that people are inherently good. And someday the world will be full of only people who respect everyone equally. And she would rather die than hate someone. <clears throat> so anyway, she's ordered around by some of the women to wash vegetables to prep for dinner. And everyone at the merchant caravan sits down to eat. Uh, some soup and she comes to this sudden realization that oh wait I just remembered that like the vegetables that went into that soup are actually poisonous and so she gets up and she tries to speak out she's like separated from the dinner table where everybody's eating and like she can't get the words to come out of her mouth above a a whisper because like I feel like her own self-preservation is kind of fighting against her will to warn them about it and she barely mouths like don't eat it and but she watches as like everybody at the table just starts downing this soup so she starts crying to herself and then she decides like for what she's done she needs to punish herself and she she starts lifting the bowl to her mouth to drink it um and then this little snot-nosed kid like throws a rock at her food bowl and she's lifting it to her mouth and it like knocks all the contents onto the ground so she doesn't eat any of it and the boy claims like, oh, I just did it because she wasn't using a spoon, daddy. Like she's acting Fuck like a this pig. Boy. Oh, this boy, man. Oh, man. And his, <laughs> pa- his parents are like, oh, yes, you were you were right to do that. You're a very good boy. Uh, and even so, she even be- despite this like cruelty, she tries to warn the boy, like, don't eat any more of the soup. Like she finally like tells them. But another man like throws a rock at her head to just shut her up. She comes back to consciousness after this and she hears like the little boy asking if he can, can I buy the slave daddy for cheap? And they're like, why do I, why do you want to buy the slave? And he's like, so I can kill her. I can become a proper man, not held back by his inability to murder when necessary. So the slave girl, like hearing this crazy argument from a kid just lets out this piercing scream at this like high note that she just she just it's weird scream because she like maintains like one note for such a very long period of time 15 seconds (laughs) uh and then at that moment as she's screaming everyone around the dinner table starts just puking up blood and dying from the poison then the only person these are awful people yeah pretty bad people uh the only merchant who um only the merchant who bought her is the one who's like coughing is not quite dead yet And he's because he doesn't like vegetables, so he didn't eat a lot of them. And she confesses to him for a moment that, like, I thought, like, I should just let them all die. And she begs him to kill her for this. And he doesn't have the strength. So he tells her, all right, you hold my rifle. And he shows her how to grip the rifle and, like, put her finger on the trigger. And, like, he gives her the guns, like, okay, you ready? And then, like, he pulls the muzzle of the gun, like, right into his chest, and, like, she pulls the trigger, like, instinctively, and it kills him. So uh, she- No, 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 no. What I think happened was he he showed her, he's like, you hold it like this, and you hold it like this, and then when he grabs it and jerks it to him, that it, it, she didn't pull the trigger instinctively. Well, yeah, and accidentally. Train, it, yeah. it made her accidentally pull it, thus yeah. making her not the actual one responsible for shooting him. That's right. I, saw, I misspoke. Her, it's not instinctively. You're right. It's accidental. Yeah, not, yeah. not making her make the conscious decision of pulling the trigger. Exactly. Like saving her of that guilt, I guess. And like he tells her in his last words, like what you said before is right. Uh, and like you'll understand one day. Basically referring to her like little speech about like everyone will eventually respect each other equally kind of thing from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, so after everyone is dead, she hears a voice coming from one of the trucks on the caravan and it's this scooter sized motor rad who congratulates her on like her brilliant strategy. He puts it, uh, he reassures (laughs) her like, you're not a murderer. Uh, because like, if you think that they would have stopped eating the soup, if you had told them you're wrong, they would have said, oh, stupid slave girl and kept right on eating. Um, and so she asks like, what do I have to do to die? Because she's just like kind of suicidal at this point. And, and the motor ad just tells her, well, that's simple. You just live out the rest of your life and you'll die eventually. So she like kind of takes this advice as if it's the only option. And so 
uh, the motorad asks her for her name and she says, I don't have one anymore. And he says, you know what? I'll give you a new one when I come up with a good one. And so that's where the credits start. But then after the credits, there's a little coda to the episode. So we find out that the slave girl like immigrates to a new country after that. And she sells off like the valuables from the trade caravan. Uh, she became rich and now works as a photographer and everybody calls her photo. <laughs> and I don't know uh, she became rich. She, she became well enough off. <laughs> well, uh, there was like a brief line that's saying like she struck it rich or something. But like oh, I really? assume that's from selling off the, the caravan stuff in the truck like the okay. motor rad told her. Uh, I don't know how rich she was. She looked like she was in like a pretty sizable house, but uh, she named the motor rad so. Uh, so they are like living happily ever after, after that. Uh, but I didn't really get like what the moral of this story was. Was it just like <laughs> bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people? <laughs> like, I, or is it I just guess. like you should always believe in the goodness of people kind of thing? I don't know. I have no idea. I, 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 I am looking forward to hoping to seeing more of Photo and So. And yeah, they were pretty cool. Reintroduced back into the story because they, they're pretty interesting. And, oh, you know, she had a happily ever after all ending. Yeah. I do also want to say that early in the episode, as I was watching, I, I'm sitting there and they're picking those leaves. And I'm like, those leaves are poisonous, aren't they? <laughs> and it was like two minutes later. And I was like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I was right. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I like I, I just felt like the show showed its hand when it did it. Like yeah. these are shitty people. Why are they focusing a little too hard on these leaves? <laughs> And it's just like another episode that doesn't uh, focus on Kino as the main character as well. Like Kino shows up at like the beginning and end to just have like a little philosophical comment on everything. Like she just says like, oh, if only those people had had a little bit more knowledge or something. And it's like, well, I don't always know everything either, I guess. So I can't talk. But like that's like basically all she has to say. So I don't know. OK, you ready to move on? Yeah. All right, let's do Girls' Last Tour, which is the only second anime where I watched the entire 24 minutes because I love the OP and ED. Uh, the first one was Princess Principal, but mm-hmm. I think I like Girls' Last Tour better. I really like the ED for this show, like, a I lot. I really love both. The yeah. OP's so good, there's just even animated-wise, because they're, like, moonwalking and they're dabbing and they're doing yeah. all kinds of crazy shit. <laughs> the dab is fantastic. I have dab emojis on uh, Discord right now <laughs> it's like oh, from really? those two yeah yeah from one oh, of the send- chats i'm in it's great <laughs> oh my god send it to this one so i can look at that that's a, that's amazing i will i'll comment on something yeah <laughs> all right so episode five house slash nap slash the sound of rain the girls talk about what a house is what what is an actual house is while exploring a certain structure they eventually find a room with two chairs a table and running water they end up staying the night in the room using their imaginations they think up the rest of the thing. Uh, and then they like furnish the rest of the room with their imaginations, which is, it's, it's just cool to watch, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next, oh, so the two finally do doze off. I'm, I'm sorry. The next day, the two doze off while driving and they almost hit a wall. They decide to take a nap and reminisce about the night before, which was stacking rocks as a game. <laughs> Chi, yeah. Chi then dreams she's on top of one of the rock stacks and a giant U shows up making the pile uh, teeter. She does eventually fall off into some water and ends up riding a fish. And then a giant U shows you a fish. You fish appears and eats Chi. <laughs> this finally causes Chi to wake back up and stuff a rock into U's mouth who is dreaming about food. <laughs> I just, these two are killing me. Yeah. You shut up, Bob. <laughs> Our roommate's out of the back room being a dick in the kitchen. Oh, okay. So I'm trying to ignore him. He's he was also it, I was stifling laughter earlier because I could hear him in the back room like yelling and then I heard him do like the like the ha 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 as he like <laughs> fucking got like probably wrecked or something playing Fortnite, right, Bob? I'm playing World War Two. Oh, you're playing World War Two. Okay. <laughs> well, I heard those <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. It's great. But That's anyways, funny. back to the anime. The two get caught in the rain later on and find some shelter to wait it out. The next scene just shows like how good the dynamics between uh, these two girls are. You, out of boredom, finds a metal pole and starts banging on stuff. She Eventually, she gets a really loud bang and she has, she has explained to her that the structure is probably hollow <laughs> like her head. Yeah. I, I think I had to pause it because I just, I just lost it. I was, it was <laughs> because Chi, the way she speaks, she's just so subtle 
and such a smart person that just like I got blindsided by it, mm-hmm. though I should have seen it coming straight on. Uh, you then uses their helmets to set them under the dripping roof and like make noise. Uh, the two then start using whatever things they can find and set them under all the drips. And like the drips are making all this cool music and stuff like that. They then relax to the sounds and wonder if this is similar to what music was. Uh, the credits then roll with music made by the dripping and the two girls singing. When the rain stops, the music stops. The end. So I, I, I really like this episode. I have a couple things to add. Um, from the first part, there's this back and forth banter between you and she about like what is a house and if like our car is like a house or not. And I think the Amazon translator who did the subtitles for this like screwed up again. Of course, Amazon screwing up because like there's this thing like where you says to she like, tell me yes or no. Is our car a house? And it's supposed to be a pun, but like it's it's translated as like she responds EA which means no in Japanese. Um, but it's trans. And then you is like, says the next line and the, the line is translated as how sad, which makes no sense at all. It just makes no sense. What is really happening. So it, it, yeah, okay. I didn't, I didn't get it either. I didn't really catch it, but usually when I don't get a joke, I just assume it is yeah. from translation or it's just like a Japanese thing. And I yes. almost always didn't dismiss it immediately this is like why i want translation notes to just come back sometimes because like sometimes a little thing simple thing like this can be explained because like the joke is that ea which is like iie if you were writing it out in like english or whatever means no but ea ie means house so like no matter how she answers the question if she says yes or if she says no ea she's she's either saying yes or house so like you has like tricked her into responding at the car as a house no matter what and that's why she sells her like oh shut up (laughs) like that joke comes back (laughs) later in the episode too but i felt like it's oh sorry i was just sitting there thinking like no yet it is your house (laughs) yeah it is yeah it basically is you're just a house on wheels exactly and that's what what's used trying to to say, uh, but I felt like this whole episode was kind of about dreams. Uh, like the first is about like their dreams really? for the future. Yeah, like because like because there was a whole scene about a dream. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, Leo. <laughs> I, that that's how I figured it out. No, it's because like they're they're you, you daydreaming about like the future. Up way too good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're dreaming about the future, like with their house and like what it could look like in the future. So they're like daydreaming about that. And then the middle segment is about like an actual like nightmare that she is having about like you like attacking her as like a fish monster. And then the final segment is kind of like this waking dream like music like melody. And I love, oh man, I love the final segment of this episode so much. Um, I, and I told you that I, I, I told you um, in a different chat that mm-hmm. like once I watched that scene, I told myself, I'm like, be calm is going to love this. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know you're kind of a, like a music fanatic a little bit. So. Yeah, definitely. And I, I like, I knew it before, like they even said like, Oh, it sounds like music. I was like, Oh, they're creating music in this world. That's like void of music. Uh, Cause they're like putting like the different, like, Meta- metallic objects under the different drips and it's going to cause different tones and I was like oh this is how they're going to listen to music and create music in this world and then I just loved how it transitioned into an actual like composed piece of music in the ED that it just like you know, smoothly transitioned into I yeah, thought that was so gorgeous it's like the sound of dripping uh, do you like that or how, how do you react to that um, I feel like it can be soothing. Like, I don't know, like once they, even they said like, I think we may have gone a little too far. It's like they put like a million cans and like their helmets. And like, at that point, the sound got like a little cacophonous. It, yeah, it's an entire orchestra and everybody's <laughs> playing what they want to play. Yeah. So it sounds like chaos. But uh, I, I brought this question up because I have a very short, funny story. Um, I'm almost, I go, I get on edge when I hear dripping anymore. Oh, okay. Because when I lived with my other buddy at his house, he was away, like, I think he was in Florida for work or something like that. And I was in the house and we, we got a bunch of heavy rains in my, I had a, a huge walk-in closet and water kept getting in somehow and dripping down and dripping down. Well, hmm. what eventually happened in the middle of the night, the water pooled in the ceiling oh, and shit. the whole ceiling ripped and fell down in the <laughs> middle of the night. Oh, and man. like I was partially awake and heard this whole thing and f- 
from that experience and like it, it's I it, it's on my old phone I don't know if I have any more but I had videos of just like running water through the closet and like I <laughs> sent it to him and I was like you have a problem and he was just <laughs> like fuck so like now when I hear dripping water I immediately like tense up because I'm like I, I, I fear something bad like that happening again gotcha okay so it was it, it was crazy I mean the sound of like ripping uh uh insulation and drywall is like embedded in my head now <laughs> yeah and you gotta sure. think this tore me from my sleep so i was just like what the fuck and then just <laughs> like you know this huge pool of water just hitting the ground it was horrible mm-hmm. he got it fixed though oh well, that's cool yep uh, must have been expensive uh i think he got them to pay for it well that's good the <laughs> they roofers. probably should because what okay I'm trying not to go too far, but the reason we he just got a new roof because we had hail come through, oh, and it wow. put a bunch of holes in people's uh, houses. Damn. So yeah, I think he ended up getting the roofers to pay for it, and they eventually found like there was like one shingle that was just like a jar, and <laughs> just the way it was situated, when the water ran down the the roof, it would just pool and just go right into the house. So wow, wow, yep. Anyways. Let's go back to t- talking about uh, Girls Last Tour. Blob Episode Last Tour. six. Accident. Some of your pepperonis. Sure. Bob. God. Bob, I'm going to kill you. I'm trying to be a professional here. <laughs> I know what this co- I know what this podcast is going to be called now. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Bob, the fucking roommate. <laughs> Episode six. Accident slash technology slash takeoff. Uh, the Ketson Crad has broken down and it's not looking good. She literally held a gear in half. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a perfectly like snapped in half gear. I was like, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, which is is still realistic because then that just means there was a fault in the metals. Mm-hmm. So be, being a guy who's a literal machinist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not too surprising. Uh she asked for help from you, and her reply is, let's get along with feelings of hopelessness instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, she kills me. I just, I can't, you, you is, you gets funnier and funnier every episode. By the way, Leo, uh, I think the, th- the theme of this episode might be hopelessness. <laughs> you think? Yeah, yeah, I'm, pre- I'm pretty Why sure. Why do you think I included that one quote? <laughs> <laughs> they get interrupted by a woman chasing a, a uh, a smaller plane who falls over and is like so engrossed in what she's doing. It takes a minute for her to notice the girls are even standing right in front of her, even with you like pointing a gun at her. Chi introduces them. And when you, she's like, I'm Chi and this is you. And then you tax on and together we are and does the, uh, dragon ball fusion dance. That was the funniest thing. Oh my God. I paused it and literally went and Googled it. So I was 100% sure that, that's what it was because I was already 99.9% sure but I just wanted to be be great and I'm just like you is the most precious but the best thing is how she just like ignores her she (laughs) she just immediately just doesn't even acknowledge she did it it just moves on so good so the other girl's name is Ishii she's an older woman Uh, and she's the one who made that plane she also says she can fix her Ketten crab in exchange for them helping her with uh, her real life plane's construction so they go to Ishii's hideout that is underground. That is an underground pl- plane hangar. Uh, then we just cue a long montage of the girls bathing, eating, fixing the plane, and getting the Ketten Red fixed. I threw bathing in here because usually we hate this shit, but it's super PG. Yeah, there was only like one shot of them from like above that I was like, uh, this is like unnecessary. But like for the most part, the point is that like they're they're enjoying finally having like the comforts of home, essentially. Like so that's all it's about. Yeah, which tacks in with the last episode. So that's cool. But Ishii is apparently going to try and fly to the next city over. She had a telescope and she could actually see another country city. Another city. Yeah. 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 Ishii does get the plane in the air eventually after they've assembled it and the girls are amazed but then suddenly the plane comes apart mid-flight and like I my heart literally stopped I was like <gasps> but the then music, you see the music was out. so good in that moment because like the it, music was swelling and like very like good up through like the whole plane flight dead on yeah you saw the yeah. girls like looking off like joyously and then like the plane breaks apart and the music like stops 
And like you see like Yu's face in particular just goes from like smiling, like having hope, for, like embracing non-hopelessness for one second and then immediately just going back to hopeless again. Like <laughs> it was it was so heartrending. Yeah. But Ishii does parachute out and lives. Yes. Yeah, but she ends up going to like the very bottom of the uh, city things again. So I liked what she said figure. to herself, though, as she's parachuting, she says like. You know, once you try so hard, but once you fail, you just feel so carefree. And then, like, yeah. the girls see her smiling, and Yuri says, well, maybe she's getting along with it. The feeling of hopelessness. <laughs> so, Leo, I think this episode might be about <laughs> the feeling of hopelessness. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also about, like, even if you tried and failed, yeah, don't let it get to you. Yeah, and it's also important to try. Like, it's important yeah. to try because, like, then you feel good about having at least tried something. Uh, so even if you fail, like, it's okay. Like, just get back up. Try again. So that's that's the philosophy of that episode. I mean, God, there was some good foreshadowing. Like, I thought of Chi wondering if Ishii might be, like, a bad person. But that, that really didn't go anywhere. Like, she just ended up being a good person. They've bumped yeah, into a couple just- people now. Like, that, that's just kind of the same thing they did with the uh, guy yeah. from one of the earlier episodes, but they've both been good people, which is, I don't know if they're just going to keep going with this trend or... I feel like they're setting us up. Like, so when they I, do... I do too. I feel like yeah. they're setting us up. They're going to introduce somebody who we don't suspect at all, and then they're a bad guy. Uh, one fun thing I would note is that Ishii, the woman who flew the plane, was voiced by Kotono Mitsuishi, who is the voice of Sailor Moon and uh, Misato from Evangelion. So it's a pretty oh, good wow. voice actress. Yeah, it's pretty cool. That's that's pretty insane. Uh, it. I just want to say one last thing about this show is, I I don't understand. I ca- I'm kind of getting it now. Why I love this show so much mm-hmm. because like it's if you were to. Pr- have presented this show to me on paper and said you want to make this into an anime yeah. I would have shot it down without even a second thought yeah. and completely forgotten it ever got presented for whatever reason it, I, I, and I told you earlier in the conversation that uh, I could watch an entire episode of them just literally driving <laughs> maybe making a couple conversation exchanges and just watching background art watching the two goof off and listening to the music because all of that is so good. Yeah, it's true. Like the background art is so fantastic and the music like, is and really great. Con- yeah. Your counter kind of argument was, well, like I would like to see more of a progression in their story or what this world is like. Yeah. And I didn't message you back immediately, but later on I thought, I'm like, well, they could do that in the background art. They yeah, they do. Progressing. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I, I, it, I mean, they have found this nice little niche yeah, and it works so well. Yeah. It wasn't working for me earlier on. Cause I was like, Oh, I'm just, this is kind of boring. And, but these last two episodes like really showed me like, okay, this is what the show is trying to, to We're like a be. lot more into the personalities of Chi and you and the mm-hmm. dynamics between the two. Yeah. And it is phenomenal. They're just really fun characters to watch. Like, they are almost polar opposites, but they both complement each other so well. It's mm-hmm. it's ridiculous. So let's move on to the next steps or next anime. Uh, no, s- I want to keep talking. No, okay, yeah, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk for a long time about Girls Last Door. Uh, so Saturdays we've got the Ancient Magus's Bride, and episode five is called Love Conquers All. Uh, so this episode opens with Chize. She's still got a knife to her neck. Um, Renfrid, uh, like this, like, is he a mage or is he a sorcerer? I forget. Do you remember? Like the evil guy, like who, oh, he's, he's not even evil, but like he's a sorcerer. No, he's, yeah. he's not evil. He's just, they just have come to, uh, indifference in this one situation. He doesn't like El- Elias at all, for sure. Um, he tells, uh, well, he, he, well, it. I mean, he's about to tell him like, he tells Elias, manga, like, this kills me. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, like, by the end of this episode, they are sort of on better terms, but he tells her they that... Leave, they leave, they separate from each other under a neutral agreement, basically. Okay. 
Yeah. So Renford tells her that Elias is like a sham of a human and has no feelings for her whatsoever and is only using Chise because of her tremendous power as like a sleigh beggy to absorb and generate magic. And they're like, we'll set you free. They, they break her like tracking necklace that are that he gave her. But she breaks free from them with the help of the cats, I think, because like, I don't know, they think like throw something at them, I think. There's like there's like a little piece of like bot pottery that like explodes or something. It's weird. I couldn't really figure out what happened. It there. wasn't her circle necklace. It might have been her necklace, but I thought it happened after that. It's hard to tell. OK, but uh, she kind of like breaks away from um the woman who's like got the knife to her neck and takes like a cut on her neck from the knife. Uh, and she say, tells him like, you know, even if you're, you're not lying about Elias, like, I don't care. Like he was the first person to ever call me family and I, and value me. And as long as he like holds her hand, uh, I'll belong to him essentially is what she says. Uh, He's basically the first person to ever have any, shown any care for her so whatsoever yeah yeah so she's going with it so elias appears and sprouts a bunch of thorns forcing alice and renfred back he refers to himself as like a pillum moralis which is latin for spear wall and that's like all these thorns coming out of the ground are like defending her from them uh he licks the cut on chise's neck with his like cow tongue which is kind of yeah and it, it, it looks like it heals her cut a bit uh, and then tells her to complete the cleansing of the corruption. So she goes up to the like evil black blob and she's when she touches it, she's transported back in time into the corruption's memories. Um, and um, one of the uh, fairies, uh, God, I forget her name. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Can't remember the fairy's name. The w- she's in charge of the wind. That's yeah. Name, no. Ariel is her name. And then uh, the cat king come with her as well. Um so she witnesses... They call her Cat King, but it's a queen. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Kings can be queens sometimes, I think. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> I mean, king king is male, queen is female. Yeah, They're typically. They're both still leaders. You can still be a queen without a king. I I just know that like in Civilization mm-hmm. Six, there's a quote from... Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce this name. It's like Jadwiga of Poland, who was the... She declared herself the king of Poland as a woman. So I don't know. It's happened in history. Who knows? I mean, maybe maybe there be may mean uh, you know a, the king has more power over a queen, but yeah, it depends on like what your the difference uh, is. procession rules or whatever, whatever succession mm-hmm. rules. Um, so yeah, she uh, she say witnesses a conversation in a tavern from long ago between the man who we know who like murders the cats from last episode that created this corruption and a traveling sorcerer who is like a young a boy. Whole new meaning the pussy murderer. <laughs> what? <laughs> He's the pussy slayer, Leo. God, <laughs> get it right. God damn. <laughs> so, I'm so, excuse my interruption. Just go on with this. <laughs> So yeah, she uh, he's talking to this like little sorcerer who looks like a little girl, but is a boy because it's anime. Um, and he is just begging this sorcerer, like, "Can you do you have any medicine that can help cure my wife who is like fragile and is dying?" And the sorcerer agrees to see his wife, but Chise can tell the guy is up to no good. And the sorcerer tells the man that his wife Mina can't be helped. Uh, she was born frail and probably only has a few years left. And the man, whose, whose name we find out later is Matthew, he freaks out and says he'll do anything, at which point the sorcerer tells him about how cats have nine lives. So after that, some villagers notice that there's like a lot of rats running around the village and they're like, Aren't, shouldn't the cats be doing their job? Uh, and Mina is feeling better and walking up and about and goes looking for Matthew, who is missing. Uh, she finds him in the deep, you could say infinite forest in a sh- <laughs> In a shed. You get one an episode. Come on. (laughs) Oh, destiny. Okay. She's in a, he's in a shed and he's just like butchering cats with a cleaver. And he, she comes in and he greets his wife and he has got this crazed look on his face and he shows her like, I have this vial of medicine I've made for you. And it's like, these cats are the ingredients. (laughs) And she tries to talk sense to him, but he tells her like, this is all for her sake. And at that moment, the sorcerer reappears and he comes up behind Mina 
and like just holds her mouth open. And then Matthew's like, just take this. And he dumps the vials contents into her and she like collapses to the ground. And even as Matthew assures her like, oh, everything's going to be all right. It'll just hurt for a little bit. She just explodes into this like puddle of black corruption on the floor. And, and, and- uh, maybe not explosion, but yeah. she just suddenly turns her entire body turns to liquid instantly. Yes, and yeah. it just splashes down, and it's oh my god, <laughs> such a horrible death. The source, she looks at me, yeah. she's like Matthew, and then yeah, it's pretty awful. <laughs> it's yeah, is 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 gruesome to watch. <laughs> and so Matthew's just like staring at this in disbelief, and the sorcerer like is all nonchalant and's like, "Oh, thanks for the research data." And then he <laughs> just goes to leave, and then like Matthew like loses his mind and decides like, oh, "I need to. I know what I can do. I just need to kill more. I need to kill more cats." It wasn't enough, and like this is when Mina's own cat, who's named Tim, it's like a white colored cat, like bites him in the neck like and tells him like you've become a demon the cat's like speaking to him and i can't allow you to live like i've become the king of the cats and like i need to stop you and so that's it's continued that cycle until today like like a, the king of the cat like sacrificing themselves to like stop the cor- corruption um back in the present inside of the corruption mina like explains to chisei that her and matthew's souls along with all of the cats who were cursed to death have forgotten how to return like to where they need to go like to heaven essentially or to hell or wherever they need to go the afterlife so they're like we Move need on. you to erase us uh and she says like i don't want to erase you from existence like you were deceived by this sorcerer like you don't deserve that and so the cat king says i have an idea i'm on my ninth life i've lived long and happy life like being taken care of by this little girl and I'll serve as a guide to direct them to where they need to go. But then Chisei, who's still not okay with that, asks Ariel, one of the fairies, like, wait, you have that power to, like, connect flowers to soil and seeds. And this makes Ariel think, like, ah, that's a smart idea. I do have that power. She starts doing something. And then Chisei tells Mina to, like, think of a dandelion and, like, how its seeds blow away in the wind. And to follow that wind with your mind and you'll be transported away along with the corruption, like and go back to where you need to go. And so like she gets blown away sort of like a flowery gust of wind and she uh, reappears in this meadow that's filled with blue flowers. Uh, Obviously like a corollary for like heaven or like maybe uh, limbo before heaven. And she finds Matthew's soul there as well. And it's like the real Matthew, not the one who was driven insane. And they like embrace each other and they fade away. And as they are, like she tells Chise who's there, like, I hope you don't have to visit this place for a very long time. Uh, and then, yeah, that was the end of that episode. Very gorgeous ending to the episode. Yep. I don't I mean, I don't have really much to say. I just thought Mina's death was really horrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we learned uh, in the episode that Elias used to be a fairy also, uh, but he's now like a half creature trapped in between fairy and human. Uh, yeah, he's somewhere in between, but he's very powerful. He's just... Yeah. Uh, He's almost an anomaly, I guess, at this point. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, episode six, The Fairy Queen. Cheesy. 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 (laughs) I'm getting hungry. Cheesy (laughs) puffs. Cheesy, having purified the mass of human anger, leaves Renfred and Alice no reason to stay around. When the two leave, they encounter that young boy from the last one in the woods. Uh, Since Cheesy is a slave beggy, she probably only has three years left to live, but Elias has thought up a way to prevent this. He doesn't speculate. There's also a huge part that apparently I skipped over because I I already knew it, so I didn't think it important. I, I thought but it was important, so I, I added it, it back You're in. right. It is yeah. important, but I, I re, I've read the manga, so like I just right. glossed over it and didn't think much of it. That's fine. But Elias tells Cheesy that he only bought her because it was advantageous to him. He doesn't understand humans, nor can he emphasize with them. He basically views her as an experiment and hopes to learn more about humans and was planning to tell her all this once she'd grown attached to him over time. He let her hear the words he felt she wouldn't want to hear. Uh, Manipulating her, basically. Uh, For (laughs) some reason, this information causes Chise to touch him on the face and tell him tell him she'll remain by his side yeah i said like for I some said reason because like i was like it's, <laughs> what it's because 
he's the first person to ever show interest in her mm-hmm. in a sense. So that's why. Okay. But anyways, uh, during the purification, it took a lot of her. So Chise has gone into basically a type of coma. And while she's sleeping off the strain from it, uh, Elias has been taking care of her in a bed he made in the woods. He's keeping her in the woods because she will replenish her magic faster there. Uh, Elias ends up having a conversation with Simon, who is the uh, preacher, when the fairy queen shows up. And it's very cool seeing how she shows up. Uh, and her name is Titania. She has Tit- control. Anya. Titania. Yeah, because she <laughs> God, those boobs are out there, aren't they? <laughs> it's just like her entrance is so ridiculous. Like <laughs> she's floating in, like basically like being brought in by like these like dogs and like this like little guy, like and just her <laughs> like, just she's jiggle physics, like, like some kind of steed, and then she's like <laughs> escorted by dogs and like this fucking weirdo little dude, little midget chibi dude. <laughs> uh her thing is she has control over all the things in the night. And Elias warns Simon not to talk to her too much. Uh, but she starts to talk to Simon and, and then Tanya takes offense to Simon because he worships a foreign god, strictly Christian, you know, basically. And then she quickly banishes him instantly to, to walk the lo- woods alone for a while with her magic. Mm-hmm. But he can get out eventually after that. Uh, then the fairy king, Oberon, her husband... Has also arrived and is viewing Chise behind their backs. Like he's kind of like a sneaky trickster type of Loki character. We learn that the main reason Elias bought Chise was because he hopes that she can help him on his wandering journey. Basically trying to figure out who he is and what he can become. Uh, You see Elias is the only thing that is like him. There's nothing else that's like him. He's one of a kind. He's neither human nor fairy. He's just trying to find his way basically. Uh, Oberon eventually uses his magic to wake Chise and she gets introduced to the king and queen. Uh, apparently you want me to include this uh, joke, Become? Oh yeah, he jokingly asks Elias like, hey, do you have any kids yet? Especially blondes. I like blondes. And like this caused Chise to blush like when she considers it and like even Elias feels like a pang in his stomach. He doesn't really understand and like they're looking on like, ooh, they're going to make babies one day kind of thing. It was, <laughs> I, yeah. I had to include that joke for reasons. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that's the gist of the episode but then the show ends with like a shot of a man walking through a graveyard leading us into the next episode and he, we are left with him saying Saying the name Isabella. Mm-hmm. You got much else you want to ask other than Titania again? Uh, just like a couple things. Um, oh, there's one funny thing. Like when Elias is talking about Chise's like magical production circuits running out of energy, I was like, is this Fate Stay Night? Like, are they going to need like a mana transfer pretty soon? <laughs> like, hopefully, this is a more wholesome universe than Fate Stay Night, and we're not going to see like dolphins appearing anytime soon. But um, that's awesome. I, I, I'm uncomfortable with the relationship that is developing between Eli- Elias and Chise at this point. Um, and like how they're teasing the romance with like, oh, how many babies are they going to have? Like, she's his slave still. Like, even if like they're developing a relationship, like he bought her as a slave. Yeah. You like, know, I never really re- uh, questioned the relationship when I was reading the manga. Mm-hmm. But now after watching the anime and you saying this stuff, then now I have been questioning it myself. It does seem kind of far stretched a little bit. Well, I mean, she comes from such an extreme situation where like she's never been shown kindness and like him. He's kind of a weirdo who like, yes, he's enslaving her, but also like he's like opening her up to like the world and like the possibilities. Well, not in the general term of enslaving. Yeah. It's more like, like of an apprenticeship, has, but it's a forced apprenticeship. Yeah. You know? She has her freedom. Yeah. But this is the first individual to ever show her any kind of kindness Mm -hmm. or even care about her at all. So I'm not surprised she latches onto that immediately. Mm -hmm. It's just like she's getting all lovey-dovey with him now, like touching his face and like nuzzling up against his face and all this stuff. And it's just like, I don't know if they've earned that yet. That's what you would do. Like what you would do if you were like in love or what you would do if you were trying to like pretend that you're okay <laughs> like or like you're in love. Like, like, I don't know. You like you were starting to finally accept another individual who has had a fucked up life like you have. Yeah. And you two are connecting. Yeah. I think the point for sure is like as we're learning a little bit more about Elias and like 
how, like I hated that speech about how he's been like manipulating her and telling her what he she wanted to hear. But the point is that like he is like part he's sort of a broken thing being as well. Like he is halfway in between human and fairy, and he's broken and looking for something to complete himself. And in the same way that she's looking for someone to show her a reason why she should live and why she is like okay being a person in this world you know the big thing is neither of them know who they are yeah they're trying to figure out who they are and now they're both elias knows who chise is so he holds the answers and chise potentially holds the answers to who elias is and that's how the two are connected i saw somebody say this is probably on reddit but like Elias is like the one who can analyze everything. He thinks with his brain and he understands. He has all this knowledge. Chise is the one who knows how to like feel human feelings, which is something that's totally alien to Elias. Like he explains, like, I can see people laugh and cry, but I understand the reasons for it, but I can't share that emotion. Correct. Um, Correct. Yeah. 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 You hit it dead on. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. Like I like the master slave dynamic is like uncomfortable for me. But at the same time, like they are all both dealing with a lot of shit that they're trying master to do through. Apprentice. Get it right, man. <laughs> OK. All right. You can move okay. on to the next thing. Yep. All right. Blood Block A, Battlefront and Beyond. Episode five, One Butler's Blitzkrieg. Have you caught up to this part yet? So, yeah, um, mostly I'm like at the beginning of season two and I watched these two episodes, like at least part of them. I kind of sped through this uh, episode six, but I watched episode five. Did you do the play at double speed? <laughs> yes, basically. And I skipped around a bit when I was like, uh, this is just like Leonardo, like talking to somebody for like five minutes about something I don't really get yet. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. Excuse me. Episode five, one butler's blitzkrieg. Gilbert, the butler, gets injured, and an additional butler named Philip is sent out to help. And as you kind of expect, Philip is out performing Gilbert in every way. He's also a combat butler and gets back Leonard's stolen wallet uh, because he got his wallet stolen again. (laughs) But the others don't seem to care, and Gilbert isn't afraid of losing his job. Turns out Gilbert is a bit of a legend among the maids and butlers because he comes from like some prestigious family. Mm -hmm. Uh, Leonard Leonardo, sorry, informs Philip that it's not a good idea that people know they are associated with Libra, which is what their group is called. So eventually Philip gets captured in a makeshift bar. It's really weird and gets his brain removed and looked into. They find out he's part of Libra and the next day they send his body back, but the bad guys are in control. Wasting no time, Gilbert realizes something is wrong with Philip and communicates with him by tapping on his back in a Morse code. Gilbert knocks out Philip and personally goes to get his brain back, but Leonardo, Zap, and Zed tag along to help. On the way, Philip wakes up and Gilbert, in a very badass fashion, gives the bad guys three choices. They, of course, don't give up and our crew wrecks them. (laughs) Taking down an entire factory in the process and destroying a shipping port. Uh, This is... this uh, blood blockade is all about action. So this is why these synopsis are super short. Yeah, yeah. Because you just watch for like all the crazy, insane stuff they're doing. Gilbert gets, gets cut down the middle of his head all the way to his throat. Yeah. But laughs it off and saying he's a regenerative at one point, which is <laughs> insane. Uh, Gilbert asks Philip if he would like to come and work for them. He completely refuses because this whole experience has been extremely traumatic for him. Jeez. Basically, this was just an episode about Gilbert the Butler, who has really had very minimal screen time, even from season one. Yeah, it was interesting yeah. to see like more of him, but like also it was it, like I didn't get much out of that episode besides like the action, though. Like, yeah, no, you learned a little bit about uh, this Butler Association, which who follows. Uh, darn it, I forget his name right now. One of the other main guys, he's got the cross thing. He does. Oh, I forget his name. Yeah, yeah, but. Anyways, moving on to episode six, get the lock out. (laughs) Good emphasis. Yeah. Uh, They literally wrote the title with two exclamation points. So, you know, you kind of got to do the out part pretty hard. (laughs) Leonardo resumes his original mission of trying to restore his sister's eyesight and the ability to walk again. Uh, The show then quickly forgets about this. 
So I don't know what's going on there. He is informed that removing his God's eyes isn't a simple form of medical procedure. It would be more like breaking a contract with a divine being. Uh, this That's season one stuff. Yeah. Um, not going to go into that. But back at the offices, Stephen is about ready to start to hack some code and figure out when another earth-shaking being will appear. But unbeknownst to everybody, a little mosquito bug flies in through the window and proceeds to blow itself up and explode. <laughs> Steven starts his hacking sequence, but suddenly there's an explosion outside and it's old ne- nemesis that they thought was so locked up. Uh, Claus, Sap, Steven, Zed, Claus was the guy I was talking about. The word. I oh, right, right, right. The name. Yep. And Leonardo leave to go and fight the guy, leaving two of Steven's assistants, assistances behind. One of the assistances leaves to go to the convenience store and one stays behind. One that stays behind notices a movement behind the couch. When she investigates, she discovers the ceiling is covered in mosquitoes. As she does, a large dark bug starts to standing behind her. The one who went to the convenience store forgot his wallet and turns around. When he opens the door, he finds a different inside and a bouncer at the door. The others quickly defeat the bad guy and return and rescue the guy from the bouncer. They then split up to try and find another way in. Of course, all the doors lead to someplace else. They get a specialized locksmith and he finds out the security system has been activated to level two. There's no way in physically or magically. Chain shows up and almost gets fried by the security system. But she did notice the whole place is full of bugs. And suddenly a ground shaker starts this to descend, making the situation worse. There's this really quick, funny scene where KK calls Steven and says she can fire a shock round into the room and clear it out. Steven freaks out because he has computers in there and Anila, one of his other assistants, is still inside. Okay. Claus then gets a call from head bug guy who's inside telling him he is going to borrow their place until he evolves into a god. <laughs> and then he then puts the building into DEFCON 1. Um... Uh, they then use Leonardo's eyes, and Claus figures out a way to scale the building and start their assault. They make it through, kill big, big bug guy, and Chain and Steven find the people responsible for the Earth Shaker and stop them with only minutes to spare. At the moment, they haven't addressed what happened to Anil. Interesting. Which is my big concern for the end. Okay. I'm like, yeah, but when are they going to, like, get into, like, restoring his sister's eyesight and stuff? Like, <laughs> uh, you, you, have seen season one right yes yeah it's it's almost episodic yeah it is for sure the, and like this episode you could watch this episode at episode two it would change nothing yeah it's definitely true which is like it's fine like because it's fun action like get to do a lot of cool stuff because of that but i do want like some things to be wrapped up eventually so we'll see any other thoughts on that nope that's the last time my thoughts i mean they're just it it's an action show. There's, they're not going much into the lore right now. They, I feel like they kind of did an episode one, but even when they do, they touch on it for like two minutes and then there's just like some battle sequence and basically all you're learning is like how their action moves work and stuff like that. So you, meh. All right. If you like this stuff, it's, I mean, it's well animated. It's cool. Uh, the backgrounds in season two are nowhere near as good in season one. Season one backgrounds were like insane. Yeah, I've but noticed like, that so good, far. Yeah. But nowhere near as good as season one. I agree. That's too bad. But yep. it's still pretty good. Yeah, for Bones. So, no, it, yeah, it's definitely a good show. What, what, very quickly, what was your, what would you give season one? Oh, I haven't really thought about that yet because I so recently finished it, but I would, I would, pro- I would probably give it around like a seven or something in the end, just because like it was good, but like it didn't like the story wasn't that satisfying to me. Like I thought it could have been a little bit stronger story wise, but like, yeah, that's yeah. The animation and art was so good. And music, especially with the way it wrapped up, you're just like, and (laughs) exactly. Yeah. It was just like leaving me wanting more like seven might be too high. We'll see. I haven't really thought about it yet. So, Okay. Let's do our final show, Land Illustrious, Yay. which is in your top three, correct? It's my, at this point, after these two episodes, it's like firmly my number one of the season right now. Whoa. I really love this show a lot. <laughs> yeah. You really do. <laughs> yeah, I definitely do. Uh, <laughs> I haven't thought about it 
it would almost it would definitely make my top five. Mm-hmm. I, c- I couldn't say three yet. I'd have to think about a couple things first, but mm-hmm. we can move on. So episode five, it's called Return. Fos has been gone for a while now and everybody's out looking for her. They do eventually find her footsteps leading to the ocean. Uh, Ventricosis, who's currently in the negotiations with the Lunarians when they demand she trick more of the jewel people. Ventricosis says they will not fall for it again and, not, and the Lunarians uh, end up burning her with their spears for basically refusing the request. This causes her brother, Aquilatus, who is like reacting to the burning flesh smell, to come out of his shell because he smells food. <laughs> the Lunarians try to force him back in and he goes on, like on a rampage and ends up falling into the sea. He's like this giant like snail thing too. And Yeah, with- just, just like a uh, fin- <laughs> Trichosis was in the first place. But what I loved about it was like when Foss like first sees him, he's like this gigantic terrifying snail monster and all Foss can say is like kawaii. <laughs> She's like, oh, it's so cute. It's a cute face. <laughs> yeah, she thought she was cute. He was cute or whatever. Yeah. But anyways, uh, he does his little rampage thing and he falls into the ocean. But we know what happens when they hit the ocean. Mm-hmm. Uh <laughs> he then comes back and he he's in his humanoid form and he starts using all his tentacles and shit and he like takes all the Lunarians like effortlessly. It's crazy. Uh, he even at one point actually hits a tentacle across uh, Foss's face and breaks a little bit part of her off. Yeah, like well, including like one of her eyes, like her left eye. Yeah. Um, Foss then after this whole deer ordeal is over and he comes back up. Foss says that she forgives them since their motives motives were for saving, you know, their own family. That, I mean, do you, do you go along with that? Yeah, I, I think that's like, well, she's also kind of depressed that like she couldn't, like, again, she's kind of screwed up. Yeah, basically she's just been a piece of shit and the prince in, in distress the whole time and like, it's just, she's just like, fuck me. I was also wondering like, cause like she has like half of her, like a third of her legs like chopped off at that point and part of her face, like if she like has not only lost like some memories, but maybe part of her personality as well at that point. I don't know. But she just seems kind of depressed. <laughs> oh yeah, no, she's super depressed. Yeah, but anyways, like I said, she forgives them and and just everything she says is very touching, and it actually really gets to Ventricosis. Yeah. Uh, she says they need to change their ways. Ventricosis says this, that she needs to change their ways, or they're no different than the Lunarians. They then take Fos with them as they escape into the sea. But otherwise, four pairs of the girls make their way into the sea. Uh, they're going in search of uh, Fos at this point. Mm-hmm. So four pairs of girls. They go to the sea. And Cinnabar is watching them as they, you know, coat their stuff with the with their th- whatever she used earlier on, and they go into the sea to try to find Fos. She's watching them and whatnot, but then suddenly behind her, Broken Fos just shows up out of nowhere. Yeah, just like face along, down in the water. <laughs> yeah, along with two of the spines from uh, Oculitis's shell. So apparently they snuck up behind her and just dropped her and ran off. And just as a quick aside, at the very end of the episode, there's like there's concept art at the end of every episode and the concept art is from that scene with like Cinnabar looking on and like uh, false face down in the water and like all these concept arts by Yoichi Nishikawa are just gorgeous. I set this one as my background recently so it's really good. Oh wow you loved it that much? Yeah crazy. it's just gorgeous yeah. So yeah this this part killed me. For whatever reason Cinnabar doesn't tell the people <laughs> yeah. 50 yards in front of them that she has false back. Yeah, they're all like exhausted from searching. She's just like, they, yeah. <laughs> she lets them continue searching for hours on end. And she just takes false back to home base and deposits her without even telling anybody. Uh, so they they search all the way into the night and they tire everybody out. But then Ruta goes back for more of the resin. And then that's when she discovers false and reports it. And I was just like, why did she not say anything? Yeah, it was kind of weird. I mean, she she kept saying, like, I, I don't have anything to do with this. I'm not involved. Like, she doesn't want to, like, accept that Foss is trying to, like, help her or anything. So, I don't know. Yeah. But anyways, it's this is pretty funny because Kongo Sensei is pissed. <laughs> and you can tell as he's watching, walking through, like, the temple, 
he's steps are thundering and it's causing material to fall from the ceiling. <laughs> it is so awesome. And then Jade, the way she's freaking out, <laughs> cracks me the fuck up. Yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, but then the other girls run away in comical fear when Sensei arrives. He yells, you insolent fool! At Foss. And it causes her to break more and actually fly off the table. Mm-hmm. But then he catches her because he still really cares about her. Yeah, it doesn't want her to shatter he, on the ground. Yeah. yeah. He then says he expects a full report tomorrow and calls off her assignment of the encyclopedia, which is interesting. Yeah. But Rutal gets Foss back together except for her legs that are somewhere on the seafloor. Uh, Rutal says she can use the spines that have a hardness of 7.5 to fashion her new legs. She has to go through some rehabilitation with her new legs just to get them to move. She also she has also lost some of her memories since her legs are gone because we know they store their memories throughout their bodies. Like at one point, like you said, she can't recognize Jay. Uh, but then miraculously, Foss figures out how to stay in the minutes. And she is super duper, ooper, duper, ooper fast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she's really fast uh so i had a couple fun things to say about this episode like there's just just one part where dia or diamond is talking to cinnabar and like they're th- wondering where foss went she's like maybe foss went looking for something she could only find somewhere else like your heart maybe which i thought was like a sick burn on cinnabar oh no that was a really <laughs> sick burn <laughs> <laughs> cinnabar's like god damn it uh, we also found out that Foss is like, she's, she's like the youngest of all the gems and she's 300 years old. It's like her 300th birthday when she comes back. Yeah. I want to say, uh, later episodes, you learn that some of the older ones are like a thousand plus years old. Oh yeah. Crazy. Next episode. Yeah, definitely. Like yellow diamond is super old. Yeah. Uh, and then like watching this specific episode, I think I nailed down like why I like the show so much. And I think it's like. It has a knack for looking and feeling like really unsettling and alien. And there's like all of this like body horror, but at the same time being just incredibly gorgeous and beautiful. Like, so it it plays that like dynamic really, really well where it's not like all like weird and scary and alien. Uh, It's like intermixed with like these pure moments of beauty and that definitely continues on to the next yeah, episode I, no i totally agree with you because the, we've already talked about it before but the characters are very gender neutral mm-hmm. but they're a female gender neutral yeah and there's so to say there's a weird thing that came up in this next episode that i'm going to talk about that relates to that which was interesting mm-hmm. uh so oh. yeah in the next episode Please which elaborate. is called first battle uh, we're introduced to Yellow Diamond, who starts the episode running from a volley of arrows from the Lunarians, and Zircon, who I think is uh, Yellow Diamond's partner, sacrifices themselves, like taking an arrow to the neck to protect Yellow. And uh, back at the clinic, Yellow is like helping the exhausted, exhausted Rutil, who had been putting Fos back together uh, in the last episode, like helps them piece Zircon back together and talks about how everyone that's ever paired up with Yellow has gone to the moon basically like all of these other gems have gotten killed like trying to like help her out um or him out as it turns out uh because zircon the second youngest gem is like yellow was saying it's dumb enough to be sticking his neck out for me the oldest of them all at like 3597 years old is how old yellow diamond is and diamond says like i can't even remember why i'm fighting anymore uh, so they notice Foss is missing and Yellow goes off running at this like ridiculous speed, literally across water, like looking for her. And when Yellow finds Foss, uh, Foss tries to run over, but she can't adapt to the speed of her new legs and speeds like a hundred feet past her or something. And she's like, I don't know how to stop. And like Yellow is like, okay, <laughs> I'm opening, opens their arms up and like tells Foss, like, I'll catch you on the next pass. And then at the last second, instead of catching Foss, like Yellow like leaps above this like beautiful like ballet jump and then like grabs the back of Foss's like top and like slows her down and like flips her over. Um, but then she like she, she gets set down on a rock and just like cracks Foss like all the way through in half, which is kind of funny. Yep. Um, so they're trying to like figure out like what's going on with Foss and the Congo sensei is like, well, her inclusions, which is I get what guess what makes gems like 
sentient. They couldn't exert their full power in her frail body before, but now that they sense like the sturdiness of her new legs, which are like a seven and a half hardness instead of three or whatever, um, they're just trying to let out all of that strength all at once. And that's why she's like so super fast. Uh, and Fos is like, oh, cool. I have a power now. I want to battle, join the battle like immediately and asks like, yellow, can you be my partner? Saying like, I'm younger and spunkier than Zircon. <laughs> I loved that line, dude. That's, that's my only, that's the only thing I wrote about this episode was, I'm younger and spunkier. Lol. That's all I wrote. It was that's really funny, my comments. That's it's, all I love. Especially when you consider, like, she's like 300 years old. I'm just like, oh, I'm younger and spunkier. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Sensei asks uh, Obsidian, one of the other girls, to bring him the lightest bra- blade that they have. And he, like, hands it to Foss and she, like, grabs onto it and it just like pulls her entire body down to the floor with its weight and he's like yeah you're still too weak but like she like tries to whip whip like lift it up like with her whole body and gets it above her head and it's like very determined I would say, ironically later on it's like the weight's nothing suddenly yeah it's weird yeah so i don't know maybe yeah. she got used to it so uh and then like he he asks her like the sensei asks her like why are you so determined to fight and like without any reservation she just responds because you have a special place in my heart sensei and I was like what <laughs> and everybody around and her the is other like girls what? are like are like what what do you mean and she's like don't the rest of you have a special place in your heart for him yeah and then like they blush like crazy like. <laughs> like they just have not admitted it yet but then so. Ye- yellow assures her like yeah no like after she starts like laughing for a little bit she's like no you know what everybody else did feel that way or still does feel that way and this is where i was talking about foss refers to yellow as onisama like brother in like the like you know kingly form or whatever sama means like so like yeah that's interesting that foss rever- uh, like refers to yellow with a masculine pronoun instead of like Onesan or whatever or no Onesama so that's interesting so I don't know if that's saying that f- like yellow is like a, just like a more masculine figure to her or is just like literally a male gender or what because this, this show is just like playing around with like gender all the time so I have no idea but they're rocks in the end so like it doesn't really matter but it's kind of interesting that yellow is referred to that way um so the episode moves on. Sensei tells Foss, okay, you can assist the amethysts or amethyst on uh, lookout duty. I'll let you do that much. And but he asks her, like, can you report to me on like what you saw in the sea and like what you heard? And because she's lost a bunch of her memories from losing her legs, uh, she's all she can remember is it was really wide and it was really big. And then she just says one word, humans. And Sensei like recognizes that word and he almost like breaks the table in front of him. And when he says like, go on, go on, but she can't remember anything else. So clearly yeah. he it's has heard of this before or is dying really to cool. find out. Or I, my theory is he's the last human. Could be. I mean, I don't know. He has these like weird powers though. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, but it's a different world. He could think of that magic. Who knows? So Fuss gets introduced to her new partner, Amethyst. Well, both of her new partners because Amethyst is actually two twin quartz crystals called Amethyst 84 and Amethyst 33. And they're quite cozy with each other. They like hold hands and they like smack their heads into each other. Cause like, I guess if they're the same <laughs> type of crystal and you butt heads, like it, you can't hurt each other. I don't know. It was kind of a weird thing. It was a, it was like a, a gem joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of strange. <laughs> And so I want to give credit to uh, Lauren Orsini, who's like the Anime News Network's episode reviewer for this series, who pointed out, at least for the first time that I saw it, that the Amethyst twins are, are named as a reference to quartz crystals who have this um, who sometimes twin, like twin crystals, form twin crystals It's called, through a process called twinning. And more specifically, like they have this idea called the Japan Law Twins. And this is like a certain type of twinning quartz configuration where the two crystals are visible individually and they meet in an angle of 84 degrees and 33 minutes exactly. And that's why it's called Amethyst 84 and Amethyst 33 in the show. So super nerdy geology reference. That's extremely nerdy. <laughs> yeah. I thought wow. it was really cool though. Like that's that's an interesting thing. So Fosco. If they're going to go that deep, I'm surprised there's not a lot more into the show. Yeah, I mean, 
That's true. I mean, like, I don't know who, how much this author like really knew about geology or not. And maybe they just picked out some cool things. Like, I think they were like, how can I get twins into this? <laughs> like, how can I get t- cute twins in this anime? And they were like, oh, well, here's this like twinning thing. Oh, th- like I got to make the characters named after this. So that's my guess. But Meh. yeah, you can go with that. Yeah. So Fos goes on her first patrol with the Amethyst twins the next day and they're like masters of sword fighting and stuff. But she's really jumpy and it doesn't help that Amethysts like they keep noticing every little bird or jellyfish or dragonfly and Foss just keeps freaking out every time. But uh, a few days in like Foss has like started sleeping on patrol like she's like not even doing anything um but they're attacked by lunarians at that point and the twins it's interesting how it happens because in what way a foss has been act reacting to everything Mm -hmm. that even every little butterfly flap of its wings she reacts (laughs) but then this is the one time where the other two react way before she does yeah that's true well she's gotten like bored and exhausted i think at that like after three days so Foss has like lost her guard one day it was like i think it was a couple days but i could be wrong maybe in a couple days yeah um so yeah they're attacked and like the amethyst twins are pretty badass like they jump up on this like platform and like they cut through like what looked like a hundred like small lunarians and then like they cut a hole in this like huge giant one but there's something weird and like glinting inside of the body. And it turns out it's just like this giant claw, like this serpent like claw that has teeth made of some kind of gemstone, clearly. Uh, and it snatches both of the twins in its teeth and starts breaking them apart. And Phyllis is looking on and she's just not doing anything. She's just helpless. She's like stunned that this is happening. Luckily, Bort and the diamond team like arrive in time and they they break apart the weapon that's eating away at the Amethyst twins, but not before it like already dropped them into like the center of this like black platform. Uh, And Sensei arrives on the scene and like there's nothing that can be done. He just says, you poor thing speaking about amethyst and then just blows away the cl- like this platform in a cloud of like gorgeous like colors like that scene in, in particular looked really beautiful like like almost like you were throwing different types of like powdered paint across the screen or something is what it looks like yeah i mean we've already decided the show looks amazing it does <laughs> it's so good looking uh and then like the last line of the episode is just bort who's like furiously demanding Foss to explain herself because she did nothing to help amethyst uh, so yeah, I just, yeah, the anime continues, continues to be insanely gorgeous. Like the music is great. And I'm really hooked by the plot at this point with like the mystery of like the three branches of humanity that have been spun off into the future and like what they all want and what they all need and like what happened to make this happen in the first place. And, and just like the individual stories of the girls trying to like help each other out. And yeah, it's just really interesting to me. Yeah, I, I don't feel like the show is really even just until recently tried to discuss what happened to humanity. And even if it's played off like what the world our world is now, mm-hmm. like why did all those three things separate? But yeah, it'll be very interesting to find out if, if they go that route. Yeah, I don't feel like they are at this point. So yeah. I don't know. We'll see. It'll be interesting. I, that's kind of what I like is because I feel like I could go kind of anywhere. Like they could keep exploring like individual like gems and stuff and just like keep getting attacked by Lunarians and like different types of battles. Like and I would be kind of fine with that. But uh, they keep to be they keep uncovering a little bit more every episode about like the whole world building of everything. So Yeah. And that was unintentionally looking at like the uh, uh, my anime list uh, character list. And I'm like. I have not met half these people on here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So like, where are you? Go- Is this a 24 episode? It has to be. Mm-hmm. But so midseason cuts. What are you doing? What midseason cuts? <laughs> that's what I was going to say. It's like, I've just been looking at like all of our shows and like even ones where I didn't like them at first, like Inuyashiki, like I've been finding more interesting stuff in the more recent episodes like damn right (laughs) so like as of episode six like there's truly nothing that i want to cut for anything else like have you caught up with any other anime that are airing i know i watched a little bit of food wars and uh i haven't 
gotten into uh, Sangatsu no Lion season too much yet. Uh, I'm sure that's really good. I keep hearing good things, but yeah, you you cut that off because you felt like it was a repeat of season one, right? Well, yeah, it was like we already talked about like a full like 24 episode length season of or 22 episodes, I think season of it. Like so, like you could go back and listen to that, and you'll know if I liked it, or you'll know if I if you like it at this point. So I feel like it doesn't serve the audience to necessarily talk about that one week to week, but maybe at the end, like I'll I'll get a review of it as i finish it um I'll, I'll definitely touch back on it at that point yeah uh the only thing i would like to cut is your stupid ass lock of just because <laughs> and i was telling you the other day like just because is like one of my top three anime this season like i uh, as it stands right now my top three are land of the lustrous uh just because and anime guitars like though actually girls last tour is edging its way into those top three like it might be number three now i don't know they're they're yeah, both really uh, good. Girls Last Tour is I got to see how the season ends. Me too. It, it it is it is wanting to grab a definite top 3 spots but I don't know how to place it yet. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, other than that, I love everything we watch other than just the usual me Ancient Magus Bride because mm-hmm. I read the manga. Yeah. I know what happens every episode. I know where they go. Really, the only thing I'm watching for is to see if they change something different Mm -hmm. or they portray something different. I I don't know. But it seems to be like, uh, from whatever people have said, like it's sticking pretty close to the manga. It's pretty dead on. And like it, uh, it leaves out stuff, but it's just kind of like the in-depth stuff. They just leave out enough that like you get what's going on. That's the gist of it. And yeah, I mean that that show in particular is moving a bit slowly, like as it sets up the characters. But uh, obviously, uh, I know it picks uh, up because it starts introducing some of my favorite characters. Okay, we get the black dog and we get the vampire, which are really awesome. Oh yeah, I'm so. excited to meet the black dog again. That'll be fun. Uh, the 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 black dog is a staple. The vampire is a quick Passover, who then shows up vaguely later on. Okay. She's really cool. But yeah, there's but, nothing airing this season that I feel like I, I need to replace anything that we're already watching with. So I did think I think we no. did a pretty good job with our picks yet again this season. Fortunately, uh, so far, I've had the best record with <laughs> our locks. According to you, but also according yes. According to me. No, no, no. According, uh, one of the things, one of your locks they might anime got tears which is i like i i accidentally somehow left it after out on my ranking Mm -hmm. because it would have been it uh but your other one i just fucking hate (laughs) other than that i think you've changed a lot more than me we go back and look Mm -hmm. i think i've only ever changed uh convenient story boyfriends and i've actually made one of my locks uh, one of our favorite shows, which is Sakura's Quest, which was... Yeah, uh, that was a hell of a good decision. Yeah, Season two. So, yeah. yeah. And, and I agree with you, it's questionable season one, but then season two just fucking... <laughs> oh, shit. Took off, yeah, for sure. Yep. It's probably um, the best... Uh, else? Well, maybe... maybe it, may, it depends on how Girls Last Tour turns out, but like I would call Sakura Quest like the best slice of life show this year, probably. So, yeah. Oh, wait, you can consider... Girls Last Tour, a slice of life? Well, that's a good question, actually. Is it more of like a little adventure show? I don't know. Adventure slash fantasy. Yeah. Maybe. Good question. I don't yeah. know. It's like kind of both in, in a little way. But uh, yeah. Uh, I feel like the two are too different to. Yeah. To compare. So is there anything else you would like to add? Uh, no, that's it. Up? So we're halfway through. Awesome. All right, guys, everybody, thanks for listening. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe to us on YouTube to get updates on podcasts or videos. And follow us on Twitter at Nurem and Other for updates as well. I'll see you right later. Peace.